public health emergency. Under the circumstances, the governor has updated an executive order to allow for public agencies to conduct meetings by telephone conference or video conference such as this. Please note the following meeting norms before we formally get started. This meeting is being recorded for public meeting purposes. If you wish to make official public comment online regarding an item on the Orleans Parish School Board meeting agenda, please submit an e-public comment card for smartphone users you may scan or QR. The QR code displayed on the screen now prior to the start of the meeting or within 30 minutes after the meeting begins. The meeting moderator will announce the speaker at the appropriate time. Speakers to self-identify with the raised hand feature at the bottom of the web page and the meeting moderator will unmute the audio. To comment by phone, please submit an e-public comment card at go.boarddocs.com slash la slash nops slash board dot nsf slash public prior to the start of the meeting or within 30 minutes after the meeting begins. The meeting moderator will announce the speaker at the appropriate time. The speaker is to self-identify with the raise your hand feature by dialing star six and the meeting moderator will unmute the audio. Any speaker should state their name and address for the record and public comments are limited to two minutes per policy. Further pursuant to policy, public comment is allowed for any action item on the agenda. There are no action items on today's agenda. Um, so any messages that are sent by the public by the chat and or QR functions will be noted in the record and will not be read as live public comment during this meeting. If you need further instruction on how to make official public comment at today's meeting, those may be found at go.boarddocs.com slash LA slash NOPS slash board dot NSF slash public, the same page where the agenda is typically posted. With that, I'll yield to Mr. Ashley. Thank you, Board Council Williams. Uh, I'd like to call to order now the Orleans Parish School Board um, meeting training for July 22nd of 2020. The time now is 9.06 a.m. May I have a roll call, please. Mr. Ashley. Present. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. I believe he's on mute. Mr. Brown, can you hear us? Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, you received a prompt. I think we lost Mr. Brown, but Ms. Ellison. I don't know Ellison. how to do it online. I'm online, but I can't. Ms. Ellison. I thought I saw Ms. Ellison dial in a moment ago. Yeah, uh, she is on. Um, Ms. Ellison. I'm here. This I'm is here. Leslie Ellison. Mr. Brown. John Brown here. Ms. Jackson. Here. Mr. Koppel. Present. Mr. Marshall. Here. Ms. Newell Houston. Ms. Newell Houston. Can you hear us? Okay, yes, she's here. She can hear us. Um, we had a quorum, Mr. Ashley. Thank you. Uh, interpretation services are available for today's meeting. I'll yield now to our interpreters. Good morning. This is Rebecca Fleming. I'll be your Spanish interpreter this morning. Muy buenos días. Si hay alguien presente que quiere escuchar la audiencia de esta mañana en español, por favor llamen al 978-990-5000. Código de acceso 707717 numeral. Repito, 978-990-5000. Código de acceso 707717 numeral. Gracias. Thank you. Good morning. 
My name is Vic Quinn Pham. I am a Vietnamese interpreter. Xin chào toàn thể quý vị. Tên tôi là Việt. Tôi là thông dịch viên. Tôi trợ giúp thông dịch cho buổi họp này. Nếu quý vị cần trợ giúp, xin gọi điện thoại số 504 975 4967. Xin chân thành cảm ơn quý vị. At this time, I would like to yield back to Mr. Ashley. Thank you so much. Uh, 1.2, Pledge of Allegiance. Can I get everyone to state the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance pledge of to, to, the flag. to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America. and, and to, the to the Republic for which it stands, stands. Yeah. One, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, moving on to 1.3, adoption of the agenda. Do we have any additions, deletions, modifications to the agenda at this time? None. Hearing none, uh, may I have a motion? So move. I have a motion by Mr. Koppel. Is there a second? Second, second by Ms. Ellison. A second by Ms. Ellison. Do we have any comment cards? Hearing none, I'll yield to board council for a roll call vote. Roll call vote, Mr. Ashley. Yes. Mr. Brown. Ms. Ellison. Yes. Ms. Jackson. Yes. Mr. Koppel. Yes. Mr. Marshall. Here. That's yes. Ms. Nolan. Okay, yes. <laughs> Motion passes, Mr. Ashley. Great, at this time, uh, we're moving on to the agenda of items 2.1. I'll yield to board council for discussion of topics. Okay, um, today we will cover four general topics, um, role and responsibilities of board, um, public records law, open meetings law, and a, a general ethics overview. We have Danny Garrett with us from the Louisiana School Board Association who's put together a, a really good presentation to cover these items. Um, before he gets started, I just wanted to quickly do an overview of our own board policy um, because his presentation will not touch on specifics of the Orleans Parish School Board policy, but I wanted to make sure um, to at least go over what is contained in each section of our board policy and highlight the areas that might be of interest um, for board members to go back and review um, at a later time after this presentation. So section A talks about the school board organization and that section sets forth the board's powers and responsibilities um, and particularly the fact that the board is um, vested with the authority and power to establish policies for the administration. Section B talks about school board operations, um, relations between the board, super, board and the superintendent, meeting procedures and um, the superintendent administrative regulations um, being established by the superintendent um, and also discusses the fact that the superintendent acts as the CEO, the secretary and the treasurer for the board. Um, section C talks about general school administration and again discusses the superintendent's duties. Section D talks about fiscal management, um, which is budgeting and one thing that comes up for us is the general fund balance and use of those funds and how funds, um, expenditure of funds is done through the, the board and the system. Um, and section E doesn't really come up as much for us, but business management issues like nutrition and insurance and risk management um, information can be found in that section. Um, facilities information for our property committee is in section F. Um, one section that I would particularly highlight is section H, which discusses charter schools um, and the board's oversight authority, um, how charter schools are renewed and, um, and um, the charter operating agreements are referenced in there. All of that information is incorporated into the charter operating agreements which e with each of the charters. So that's a section um, that I would um, highlight as one that actually comes up quite often. And the other section is K, which discusses things like use of school properties and how information is provided to the public by the administration. Um, but those are the sections that I would highlight as um, portions of our own internal policy that the board might want to review 
um, after this presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Garrett. There we go. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. We're gonna try to make this as painless as possible. Um, certainly, if there are any times where you need me to stop and you wanna have more detailed discussion, because the, the presentation in the PowerPoint is, is fairly detailed, but the goal is to get a better understanding of these concepts and of these provisions, and therefore, having a conversation is usually a better way to do that. Um, you know, for those of you that have been in the sort of educational realm, it's the same thing with teachers. Um, you know, students don't learn as much if you just sit there and lecture at them as, as they do if they engage in the discussion. So I invite you to do that. Um, whatever, you know, do the hand raising function, unmute yourself, stop me. Um, now, to begin, uh, I am a private attorney. I have a contract with the Louisiana School Boards Association. I provide lobbying services as well as legal and consulting services for the association. And I do a number of these trainings for them. Uh, I am also a certified ethics trainer, but as I will tell you later on, the piece that we do on ethics is not gonna get you out of your one hour of ethics training because that's a little bit more in depth, but you can all get that uh, either online or at the LSBA convention, frankly. Um, so the first thing, uh, again, the LSBA, uh, formed uh, 1938. Um, we represent all 69 elected school boards in the state of Louisiana. Uh, they're all a little bit different and they all have uh, unique makeups. And one of the things I can tell you is from a political standpoint, we have from the most liberal liberal to the most conservative conservative and a whole bunch of people in between. And the Louisiana School Boards Association strives to look at issues upon which we have consensus in public education. And we try not to uh, uh, pit members against each other. Uh, because one of the things I think that makes school boards uh, very uh, adept at what they do is that they do represent that entire community uh, from, from every racial background, from every corner of the school district. And so it's that collective that usually leads to the best decisions. Now, our objective today for a better understanding of roles and responsibilities of, it, of school board members, a uh, better understanding of the public records law, a better understanding of the open meetings law, and a better understanding of the code of governmental ethics. We, this is not legal advice. You know, we're not saying you're breaking the law or you're illegal, because one of the things I have learned in my 25 plus years of practicing law is that the only person that gets to tell you what the law actually is in, in, a, in a particular factual circumstance is in fact the, the, the person wearing the long black dress in the courtroom. Um, and there've been lots of cases where I thought I was absolutely right and the judge told me I was wrong. There've been other cases where I was like, I'm not sure why I'm even here and the judge agreed. Um, and every circumstance is gonna be very fact specific. What we're trying to get you is a general understanding of those concepts so that as you move forward, you can try to apply them and at least know to ask the question. Uh, I learned something from a drill sergeant in basic training that has stuck with me for the rest of my life, and that is there's no such thing as a dumb question except for the one that you refuse to ask. Uh, because if you have a question, odds are somebody else in the group has a question. Don't believe you're so unique that you're the only one who thought of it. And getting that question answered, or at least getting that question discussed, is usually the best way to benefit everyone's understanding. So let's go. Um, I'm sorry, I probably was supposed to be saying next slide. I think I'm on slide three. Uh, sorry about that, uh, Stephanie. <laughs> All right, now to slide four. Um, the school board is a creature of the state, uh, created by the legislature, by its constitutional authority, and then the school board under the constitution then uh, appoints a, a superintendent. Um, and it's interesting because it actually says each board shall elect a superintendent which is somewhat an interesting use of term uh, because there was a recent ethics opinion issued when a state representative wanted to know whether or not within the two years after they left the legislature, whether they could be uh, appointed as the clerk of the house. Well, under the appointment of the clerk of the house, it actually says the house elects the clerk of the house. So the board of ethics actually issued a ruling that said, hey, they elect them, they don't appoint them technically, so the two-year prohibition in the Code of Ethics doesn't apply, 
which is very interesting because I have, I've had a discussion with the Board of Ethics. Uh, local parishes, police juries elect their treasurer, and y'all elect your superintendent, technically. So it's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Now, roles and responsibilities. The primary statute that you will find the core roles and responsibilities for a school board member and for school boards is revised statute, I'm sorry, next, Stephanie, uh, 1781. Now, next, <clears throat> each local school board shall serve in a policymaking capacity that is in the best interest of all students enrolled in schools under the board's jurisdiction. When establishing board policies, each board shall prioritize student achievement, financial efficiency, and workforce development on a local, regional, and statewide basis. When choosing a local superintendent of schools, each board shall select a leader who, who shall prioritize student achievement and shall act in the best interest of all students enrolled in the schools under the board's jurisdiction. Now, the, a variation of the word student is used one, two, three, four times in the first paragraph that sets forth what the general powers of a school board are. Uh, that is a, uh, a very telling use of words. Um, as a lawyer, I'm always telling people and a lobbyist, words mean stuff. And the fact that the legislature has directed that the school board's roles and responsibilities initially focus on students. And that's why most of you chose to, you know, get that gigantic paycheck they pay you to be on the school board and to go through the difficulties of a campaign. I think it's because most of you, the vast majority of you are here because you want to make life better for students. And that's your, that is one of your primary goals is focusing your actions, your votes, your policies on students. Now, how do you do that? Uh, Orleans is a little bit different. Uh, uh, Pepe Bruno once referred to it as the independent Isle, Isle of Orleans. I was on legislative staff back in the day, and um, Mr. Bruno taught me a lot uh, about some things that had nothing to do with politics. But in Orleans, y'all have the unique situation next. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Stephanie, I'm on slide eight. And y'all have a, are replete with the type three charter school. It's a unique creature that most people do not have. It adds to you a second layer of responsibilities. Uh, those are those type three Bs, those were the type fives. They got transferred to your auspices. Um, they continue to operate as charter schools when they moved over. They had uh, buildings, they had operators, they had uh, charters, and they were transferred to y'all over that process during 2016, 2017, 2018. So y'all have a sort of a, a unique circumstance. Next. Under that, you have to then look at what are your responsibilities with regard to those type threes, because not every, not every other school board in the state has that additional layer of responsibility. Um, Ms. Williams spoke that y'all have an entire section of your policy manual directed solely on that, uh, because it is a much larger component of what y'all do. Next. Under Revised Statute 1710.7.1, uh, subsection E, there are a list of nine uh, elements that y'all are called to do with regard to those type three charters. Uh, you adopt policies establishing the process for district-wide funding allocation. Um, next. Uh, you also determine the use of local revenues or repurposed taxes from a parish-wide, for, for parish-wide functions that those type three charter schools will be accessing. Uh, you also approve those charter operating agreements and, and the renewals thereof. And I know Ms. Williams mentioned y'all have a specific policy on that. I know that in the last year, that issue has come up and y'all have had to make that decision. Um, very much a unique decision uh, that other districts don't have to deal with. Uh, but y'all are sort of forging the way forward. Next, um, you also have uh, the, uh, the obligation to require that charter schools on your jurisdiction participate in your parish-wide enrollment system. Uh, again, somewhat unique from charter schools in other districts uh, because of the nature of how y'all came to be the authorizer for the type three Bs. Um, you also may adopt policies for charter schools under your jurisdiction uh, that are in good standing 
and in regard to compliance with board policies regarding enrollment and student expulsions uh, and that such schools shall, uh, shall be exempted from the minimum enrollment percentages required in the general charter law because your charter schools function as a hybrid between a true independent charter school and a district run uh, geographic attendant zone school. Um, again, it's a somewhat unique responsibility that y'all have that many school boards do not. Next, you also may provide for lottery preference for enrollment for uh, elementary and middle school students under your jurisdiction uh, by geographic area. Um, uh, the, the closest thing that I can think to that is, I know in, um, there are a number of districts that, for example, East Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge High. Baton Rouge High takes kids from the entire school district, but they allocate slots based upon the various zip codes around the city. And then each zip code has its own sort of lottery uh, if there are more applicants than spaces available. Um, so you may have a circumstance where you have one one zip code that has twice as many applicants as slots available for that zip code and another zip code that just barely has enough to fill their slots. And so each zip code is sort of handled independently. Next, um, you also have, oops, yeah. Yeah. you also have the ability to provide for how you distribute and defer uh, your deferred local revenues. Again, it's a, it's a level of responsibility that y'all must meet because of your unique circumstance. Um, uh, one thing I do tell everybody though is, yes, you are unique, but so is every school board in the state. Every school board has unique challenges. Every school board has common challenges, but y'all particularly have a, a different circumstance because of uh, being the first sort of all charter district um, in the country, I believe. Uh, so y'all will have to sort of lead the way forward as other schools as other school districts deal with both the portfolio of both district run and charter. Now, it's my appreciation that y'all actually taken over the district operation of one school fully and another through an agreement. Um, so y'all are actually sort of morphing a little bit into what other districts are, um, but, and it'll be interesting to see just how, how y'all deal with those challenges because they will be somewhat unique to you. All right, next. All right, this is a critical, a critical statement. The school board's authority versus the school board member's authority. Nothing in law grants authority to an individual school board member except as a voting member of the school board. It is with the school board that the authority relies. And that's very, very important. Uh, really, before I really got working with the LSBA, my first interaction from a legal standpoint with school boards was about a decade ago. Um, I participated in with a group that did redistricting for about 32 jurisdictions around the state, including um, eight or 10 school boards. And one of the terms that I heard a lot was uh, the, the, the term my school. And it was interesting when I was doing that redistricting, how school board members particularly were very concerned about the physical school buildings that were in within their school district. And it's interesting because I also did municipalities and I did police juries uh, and parish governments. And it, it's funny because in two parishes, the school board and the police jury had the same membership and they hired our group to do them both at the same time. They wanted their districts to remain coterminous. And when I would meet with the school board member and with the police juror, the police juror was concerned about how many road miles he had in his district and the school board member was looking for what, what school attendance zones were in their district. So it was a really kind of an interesting dynamic. But remember, the authority of the school board lies with the board, not with the individual members. In fact, going back next, going back to 1781, which is that core principle, go down to subsection P. No school board member shall act in an individual capacity to use the authority of his officer position as a member of the school board in a manner intended to interfere with, compel, or coerce any personnel decision made by the superintendent or a school principal, including the hiring, promotion, discipline, demotion, transfer, discharge, or assignment of work to any school employee. The superintendent, as the instructional leader of the district and its chief executive officer, shall have primary responsibility for personnel actions in the district. 
Additionally, no school board member shall use the authority of his office or position as a member of the school board in a manner intended to interfere with, compel, or coerce any school employee to make any decision concerning benefits, work assignment, or membership in an organization. And so that memorializes that the school board member's role is not as a one-on-one -on -one conduit with school employees or members of the administration. Now, it doesn't mean you have, can't have conversations. It, it doesn't mean you can't express your opinion. It just means that you have to understand that the authority to adopt a policy or implement a rule lies with the board itself. Um, I, we did a, uh, through the LSBA, right after the, most school boards had their elections back in 18. And so in early 2019, we did a series of newly elected school board member trainings around the state. And, you know, we, we sort of went through this process and one of the school board members, I could, one of the new members, I could tell he was getting more and more uncomfortable with the conversation. And he was shaking his head and, and then squinting his eyes. And then we said, all right, are there any questions? And he raised his hand. And he said, doesn't look like I got elected to do anything. And we're like, pardon? And he said, I got elected by 64% of the people in my district on a promise that I was going to fix. And he named a particular school. And what we tried to explain to him is that you can still fix that school. It's just that you, you can't fix it maybe in the way you thought you were going to fix it by going down there and telling people at the school how they, what they were going to change to, to obtain student achievement. What he was going to have to do, as we explained to him, was he was going to have to work amongst his colleagues on the school board to implement budgetary policy, operational policies, or other rules that he believed would make that school and those students succeed. And he would need to essentially sell that idea to his colleagues on the board so that the board could take the action to lead to that student's success. And it wasn't, and it wasn't that he, you know, he couldn't achieve his goal. He was just going to have to achieve it in a different way. It was interesting as part of those uh, trainings, we made a point to get a number of veteran school board members, uh, some who are actually on the LSBA executive board and some who are not in the particular regions where we held this. And one of the things we asked them to do is to tell these newly elected school board members, what's the mistake you made in your first term? What was the biggest mistake you made in your early days being on the school board? And uh, one gentleman was, was very frank and he said, I learned not to make promises that I could not personally keep. Because I didn't, and he told this, this gentleman, he said, I did the same thing as you did. I told people I was going to get us a better football coach. I was going to get us a better football coach and we were going to win more games. And I realized that wasn't really my role. And so what I then had to do four years later when I ran for reelection is I had to explain to people that that wasn't my role, but, but these were the things that I did do in my four, first four years on the school board to make our school district, for everybody in the district, a better place. Um, we had another gentleman who, um, he, he was on a school board before the passage of Act 1 in 2012, which uh, sort of more formalized the superintendent's role with regard to personnel. And he, he told these, these newly elected school board members, his biggest mistake was believing that he individually knew how to run a school. And he, he related that in his early days on the school board, his, quote, his principals did not wipe their nose without calling him first. He then went on to say, it didn't take me long to realize that I didn't have either the education or the training or the experience to actually make those day-to-day -day decisions in a school building. And he, he, he shocked the room when he made a statement uh, about Act One, because there were, in, in, the, in the few years following 2012, many school board members wanted the school board association to spend all of its time repealing Act One. And he said, this is gonna shock you all, but thank God for Act One, because it let me focus on what I needed to do as a school board member with regard to budgets, and policies and those larger issues. And I was going to hire the best superintendent I could and implement policies 
to give that superintendent the ability to make the day-to-day -day decisions that were in the best interest of students. And a couple of people thought, I thought they were gonna fall out of their chair, uh, but it was, very, it was a very telling statement because he clearly had come to that understanding that his role was not to personally go make that change. It was to set foundations in policy and in rules and in budgeting to make for a better school district for the students. Next. And again, my school. The term my school is not, val is not a valid term related to a school board member, um, particularly now where every school district has some element of school choice. Um, y'all have been, I mean, with your, uh, with, with your one app system, y'all have had students from all over Orleans going to schools all over Orleans. So you may have a school building that's physically located in your election district, but the students who attend there have parents or, or reside in three, four, five uh, other school districts, uh, other school member election districts. And it's interesting because when I was doing uh, the redistricting for a particular school district, we had a problem there. I mean, the numbers drive redistricting. You just, you got to make the numbers right. And uh, I had the, a school board member and I told her, I was like, look, I've got to move this line. There's just, I'm, I'm looking at, here's the map. There's just no other way to do it. And her response was, oh, but, but that'll take Evelyn's, that's Evelyn's school. That's got, that, that school district, that, that's, that high school has to stay in Evelyn's district. It's always been in Evelyn's district. I can't take her school. And I said, I, I don't think you're taking her school. We're just, you, you, you may getting the voters that that school happens to be close to. And she said, well, I'm gonna have to talk to Evelyn first because I'm not gonna take her school without her permission. And it was funny, a couple of years later at an LSBA event, that school board member came up to me and she goes, you know, Dan, it's actually turned out to be pretty good because now, I fight for that school because it's in my district and Evelyn fights for that school because a whole bunch of kids that go to that stick, their parents vote for her. And so now they have two members of the school board. So I'm not really sure she got the point, but, but cause hopefully every school in the district has a bunch of people on the school board. Um, and, and again, y'all are in a somewhat unique circumstance cause y'all, I mean, I don't think that uh, I'm out of bounds saying this, you have more school choice than anyone. Uh, Y'all have more people attending schools that are not probably physically located within a mile of their of their house, probably than any 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 district in the state, just because you're of your unique makeup. But what it does do is it reinforces the notion that the physical location of the school building doesn't vest any individual with more or less authority. That you all have an obligation to do what's best for the school district for all of the children in the district, and and frankly. That's harder. That's a harder decision to make. Um, it, it's easier if all you have to worry about is a couple square miles. It, it, it really is. And, 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 and I only have to worry about, you know, how the kids are doing in these two schools that happen to be in my election district. It's a lot more difficult to have to worry about everybody. Um, so, you know, God bless that y'all have chosen to make that choice because uh, we know you didn't do it for the money. Um, and it's interesting because it, not long after Act One, I actually did have an older school board member pull me aside at, at an event and say, "But Dan, honestly, don't you think that I should have more to say about who the football coach is at one of my high schools?" And we had to have about a thirty-minute conversation about the term "my high school." Uh, so hopefully, um, like I said, y'all have been in a much more unique situation. Um, I think that the reinforcement, and it's not just older. It's funny because. I, I've seen 35 year olds get elected to the school board and their first words that you hear from them sound like they were, they've been on the school board since 1976. Um, and, and back in the day when, you know, I picked the principal and I picked the teacher. So just remember my school is not really a term. It's our schools. All of them are our schools and whether they are a type three B charter or whether they are district run, or whether they are a, a type one charter in another district or a regular type three in another district, your responsibility is to all of those students in the entire school district, not just to those who happen to vote for you as a member, uh, as an elected member um, in a single member district. Now, basic requirements for successful school boardmanship. 
uh, sorry, Stephanie, next. I'm on slide 18, Stephanie. Um, normally I do this in live, and so I'm just, I'm changing those, those slides by myself. First of all, demonstrating initiative, informed leadership and insight in board planning and policy, effectiveness in professional relationships, effectiveness in staff and group relationships, and courage for the good of schools in spite of pressure or influence. Next. Now, school policy, system policy manuals. Uh, Ms. Williams spoke to you about y'all's policy manual. What are they? Those are the policies, those are the principles that y'all have established to chart how the district is going to proceed. That is the roadmap or the guide rails that you provide to your superintendent and, the, and, and superintendent's administration for how we're going to move forward. What are our goals? What are our priorities? Um, they should be broad enough to indicate the line of action to be followed by the administration. But they also need to be narrow enough to give clear guidance. Um, because again, one of the primary decisions you will make as a member of the school board is the hiring and renewal or not of a superintendent. And with any circumstance where you have someone who's carrying out your vision, when I say yours, I mean the vision of the school board, the best way to do that is to communicate that vision. Policies are the manner in which you do that. Next. All right. Um, it's, this is one of Dr. Pope's, the executive director of LSP's favorite slides. The board doesn't solve problems. The board uses policy to establish the criteria for how problems will be solved you're not making those decisions day to day. You're not, you're not making that change for that one student or that one teacher or that one class or that one school. You're setting up a framework so that as best decision as possible can be made. And I say as best decision as possible as can be made because as you all have, you're, you're all coming to the end of your first term, you all have, have now probably realized there is not any decision that you make that will make everyone incredibly happy. Um, it's the nature of representative democracy that you're not going to make everyone happy all the time. Hopefully, the people that weren't happy with the outcome, at least were not unhappy with the process. And that's where y'all can come in. Setting up that framework through policy will ensure that regardless of what the outcome is of a particular circumstance, the process that, that was used to re reach that outcome makes everybody feel like they sort of had their day. Next. Again, it, when you're looking at whether something is your purview or not, the question is, is this board work? Okay, so is this, a, is this something that requires professional education, knowledge, or expertise, or training, or experience? If so, it's probably in the domain of the superintendent or staff, as opposed to the broader policy guideline that y'all decide. Um, I read something in the paper this morning um, that struck me and a school board member uh, put out a, uh, everybody's, been everybody's been putting out their plans, their reopening plans. And a school board member put out on Facebook a couple of days ago, hey, I know the plan that we passed, but just to give everybody a heads up, they're, it's getting ready to be changed. We're going to push the start date back of school. And I mean, everybody just blew up. I mean, it went everywhere, went all over the district. And they're supposed to be having a news conference today <laughs> at 10 o'clock. So they should be starting in about 17 minutes in which the superintendent and the new superintendent that's coming on board, were going to announce potentially a change in a proposed school opening plan. And the school board member has now taken down that Facebook post and she made a very telling comment in, to the newspaper. She said, I took the post down because I realized that was out of my lane. That it wasn't for that individual school board member to be alerting the world about what was about to happen from an administrative standpoint, that it, it, it probably should have been something that came from the board or from the administration. Um, and and it was interesting that she, she sort of come, came to that understanding. And I think when people started calling and go, well, are you making this change? Or why do, do you have the authority to do this? And people started questioning whether individual school board members were going to have the ability 
to literally change the opening date for the schools in their districts. Um, and so it, it was one of those circumstances where it's like, you know what, that was probably something that better came from a centralized voice than from an individualized voice. Next. Um, some of the basic requirements of being sort of a good school board member is accepting the principles of teamwork, board unity, and subordination of self-interest, recognition that in-service training and self-study are essential, and understanding the executive function delegated to the superintendent and the administrative staff, and the willingness to support the board administrative policies. So it's a situation of making sure that you understand that concept of being part of a group. Um, as someone who played sports when I was younger, it's kind of like if the pitcher on his own decides he's going to throw a different pitch than what the coach called and what the catcher is expecting, odds are that ball's going back to the back, back to the backstop because the catcher's not going to be expecting it. It's like if, if one player on a, on an offensive football team decides instead of running the play that was called, I'm going to run a different play you're destined for failure. And in any team, which a school board becomes, and any team having people working contrary to what the team is moving forward and doing is likely not to be successful. Next. Um, let's see. Let's see. There we go. Now, uh, additional elements. Demonstrating initiative, informed leadership, and insight, in board planning, and policy making. That's really the function. Inform yourself. Convince, if you believe that there's a policy of your school district that needs to be different and would lead to a better result for students, know it, learn it, get the backup data, and then convince your colleagues. Because if you can convince your colleagues, if you can provide them the information that they need to make that same decision as you have, that gives you the ability to make that policy become reality as opposed to just telling them, this is what we ought to do because that's just what I think. Doing that homework and convincing those other people is, is, is a critical element. I've, I've represented public bodies all over the state for a lot of years. And I, and I try to tell every elected official that's part of a, an elected body, you need to learn to convince your colleagues first. Convincing the public is usually easier and, and takes less effort because your colleagues are the ones who actually have to vote. They're the ones who are actually gonna to have to cast a vote and explaining to them why you think this is better. Winning, winning sort of their heart and mind is the best way to move forward with that policy. And part of that is effectiveness in professional relationships and in staff and group relationships. Develop that relationship to where you can have a conversation with a colleague on the board about a difficult topic without it becoming acrimonious or condescending. Um, I had a, a, a pastor gave, I'm, I'm big on stealing advice from people. I had a pastor who gave me advice one time and said, you and I can disagree without one of us necessarily being wrong. And it really changes the dynamic of a conversation. If when you're trying to convince someone of something, they don't have to just capitulate and go, oh gosh, Dan, you're right. I was completely wrong. You are the God of all you under, you know, it's never going to happen. That's Perry. That happens in you know movies and TV. But generally, sometimes you're going to have to agree to disagree. I mean, anyone who's been in any sort of group, and that's just not an elected official. That's within a business circumstance. You're always going to have to figure out a way to, be, to agree to disagree if you can. Or try to figure out, look, what I believe to be the truth and what you believe to be the truth, what may be the truth might be somewhere in between. And we may not have the information or we may not have the experience to know that, but understanding that that's a possibility and, and I don't have to win every vote. That you're not, you know, I've seen the, uh, unfortunately I've seen the Louisiana legislature change a bit over my time. And it seems like uh, some in politics believe that the only way to get anything done is if you and I disagree, you're evil, I'm perfect. And you know, that, and, and that's just it. And if you disagree with me, you, I, I put you aside. Um, next. Now, common errors the school board members make. Filing, failing to abide by your own meeting policy. Uh, meeting policies are incredibly important because 
knowing how you get recognized by the chair, knowing how you put something on an agenda, uh, knowing how your uh, public comment policy works, knowing all of those things and abiding them makes the meeting run better. I try to tell members that if you, the individual members of an elected body, do not follow your own policies with regard to things like decorum um, or process, then it makes it very difficult for the presiding officer of that body to then make the rest of the public also comply with the rules. So if board members are going to yell at each other from the end, from either end of the dais, don't be shocked when somebody sitting in the ninth row of the audience feels like he can join in the conversation and just yell back out at you. Because, you know, people learn, you know, people learn by what they see more than what they read. And uh, that goes in the next item of lacking patience. Sometimes the best policies are the hardest ones to get done. Uh, there's, a, there's an old saying among lobbyists, bad bills pass easy. Really good pieces of legislation sometimes take years. And you have to be willing to understand that, that you may not, you may not be able to get this done right now because it may be a situation where there are other factors that impede it. Maybe you wanna do something, but you know what? You need, you need to wait till you're formulating next year's budget in order to lay the groundwork to get that accomplished. And having the patience to understand that can oftentimes lead to a better outcome. Lacking decorum. Um, one of the presentations that we make to new school board members is how to be a school board member without becoming a member of an unintended circus. If you lack decorum among yourselves, I guarantee you the public is going to lack decorum with regard to all of you. And you know, uh, I, one of the things is, I mean, particularly now where everything's on the internet and there's social media everywhere, I tell people, it's like, if you have two school board members who have a, a disagreement and the disagreement goes in one of two ways. Um, Ms. Jackson says, Mr. Marshall, I, I appreciate that he and I differ on this. And I understand that Mr. Marshall's position is what he believes is in the best interest of the students in Orleans Parish. But I just respectfully disagree. I think because of this reason, and this reason, and this reason, I think we would be better as a, as a school district to go in this other direction. I just think that's the better way to go. Or, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we all know what Mr. Marshall's trying to do. We all know that he only wants to protect the people of his district. We all know that he doesn't care about any of the schools that are on our side. He, we all know who he works for. We all know who he takes his marching orders from. And frankly, we know he doesn't really care for students at all. Which of those is gonna get, go viral on the internet? I, I tell members, I, I, my, my goal is boring. Boring meetings are more effective than non-boring meetings. Because going back and forth, yelling back and forth at each other, not waiting for people to recognize, using discourteous language, people just like watching that. It's why people stop and look at car wrecks and buildings on fire. It's why, you know, they have, how many different shows do they have of people falling down and tripping and and doing crazy stuff on, on, in videos. They're funny and people just like to watch them. But what happens is they ultimately end up losing respect for the body because they see the lack of decorum. And then the people that actually come to your meetings, if y'all yell at each other, then they think it's okay for them to yell at you too. Next, challenging the board after a vote. Look, you will virtually never be on an elected body in which you're on the winning side of every vote. But being able to let that go, being, being, instead of saying, y'all made a terrible decision, that doesn't mean you can't believe it was not the correct decision. It doesn't even mean that you can't work in the future to change that policy. But if you challenge the validity of making that decision, then you're challenging the entire process which means if 
if the decision that you disagree with that the board makes shouldn't be implemented, well, then there's going to be somebody who says the decision in which you agree with that the board implemented shouldn't be complied with. You got to be in that guess, so letting the last uh, vote, don't let the last vote color the next vote. There are times where I have seen where because of a vote, I lose a vote five to four. I'm on the four. And that fifth person who voted the other way, I thought I had them. And they went the other way. So if I say to myself, huh, last time that person ever gets a vote from me, I'm now making a decision about policies that affect students without actually knowing what that policy is going to be. Um, I tell my lobbying clients, you have to be able to thank a representative who gives you one out of 10 votes. And that's a very hard thing to do. Because you know what? If they give you one out of 10 votes, then maybe at the next 10, you might get two out of 10. But I mean, I've had clients that wanted me to go yell at a legislator because he voted the wrong way. And then I remind them, he's voted with us the last nine times. So we got, we got nine out of 10 votes. I don't believe we can go yell at him for the one um, and that, that he didn't go with us. You've got to move on to the next thing. Um, next item is carrying a third party or hidden agenda. There will be people and every, every elected official has, has experienced this who try to come to you and tell you that they're, you, they are the reason that you're in elective office and that they want you to do what they tell you to do, but they don't want people to, they don't want to be out front and saying it themselves. And it's very difficult because with elections, I understand that running an election costs money and people want to say, well, if I give you money, you have to do what I say. Well, but lots of people gave me money. And actually, as we look back, my job is try to make the decision that's in the best interest of the students of the school district. And sometimes you're going to agree with me and sometimes you're not. I try to tell people, if you're expecting an elected official to elect someone who, who you're going to agree with every time, you're in a world of hurt because we marry people and stay married. I've been married 30 years and my wife and I don't agree on everything. So if I had insisted that we agreed on everything, I don't think we'd have been married for about 15, 20 minutes. So there's just no way to do that. And so you have to be, but be careful that people use you to carry out their agenda. Because if their agenda is valid, they can show up at that meeting and say it. They can say it to everyone. Um, you know, it always, it always worries me when somebody tells me and say, look, I'm with you, but don't tell anybody I said that. Um, I, I had a conversation with a lawyer one time and he's like, oh no, Dan, I don't put that kind of stuff in emails. I'll do a phone call so I, so I can deny it. And I'm like, why would you do that? And I always challenge people, if you're gonna tell me something on the phone, uh, be willing to put it in an email or a letter, uh, because if you're not willing to document it, then, then I'm going to be a little bit suspicious. So just be careful that you don't get inadvertently used by someone to achieve an agenda that, that's important to them, and it might not be in the best interest of the school district of the school district's children. Next, and last two. Speaking about confidential issues, all right. As school board members, y'all come into contact with a, a significant number of confidential issues more so than the regular elected official now because y'all have the whole student realm um and you know when when it gets to issues such of it as such as uh, expulsion committees you also have issues that pertain to employees there's an entire section of the open meetings law called executive session most of what's in executive session is going to be confidential and you shouldn't be speaking about it um, we'll get into it a little bit more later in the day, but just be careful that you disclose information that you know to be confidential. Even, and I'm not saying don't just, don't just not put it on Facebook <laughs> or Twitter, but be careful in who you share it with. Because ultimately, that usually you obtain that information because of the board. And for example, when it's, if you receive attorney-client privileged information, that privilege belongs to the Orleans Parish School Board, not to an individual member of the Orleans Parish School Board. And you don't have the authority to waive that attorney-client privilege. 
It's very similar to the, to the, to the private sector world. If you're on a board of directors of a company and the company's attorney provides confidential privileged information to the board, it is not any individual board member's purview to go out and waive that privilege and, dispo and disclose that confidential information to the world. So just be very careful. Um, and I would always, if you're not sure, consult your legal counsel. And I'm, I'm a big believer in following what your legal counsel says, because in most circumstances, if you follow the advice of the legal counsel, there's not a whole lot negative that can happen. Uh, and the last one is, avoid considering the staff as the enemy. Don't make it the board versus the administration. And sometimes if you're on the losing end of a policy, superintendent comes and makes a recommendation for a policy. That policy is passed by one vote margin. That means about half the school board disagrees with the superintendent. But that can't be a basis to foment a sort of cantankerous relationship. Because understand, that superintendent is who carries out your policies. And just as that superintendent is going to carry out that policy that you didn't vote for, you're also going to depend upon that superintendent to carry out the policies you did vote for and that you do think are in the best interest of the school district. So you can't really have it both ways. You can't say, well, you shouldn't do the policies that passed by one vote when I was on the losing side, but if I was on the winning side, then I would want you to. I think that everybody is, is in this for generally a common reason, and that is to make the educational experience for the children better. And I think as a board member, if you can keep that core belief in place, that you're there as a member of a body for that body to take actions for the benefit of students, it oftentimes resolves a lot of the little stuff. It resolves some of the things that can become petty and then grow into something that becomes cancerous. So if you don't get anything out of this, just remember, you're part of a board, convince your members. And I always tell people, it's a whole lot easier to convince someone cordially. I've never had anybody change their vote because I cursed them, never. It's just never happened to me. Um, I try not to do it because I don't think it works. Um, and even if I think they made a bad decision this time, I'm gonna hold out the notion that the next time, the next issue that comes up, I'm going to voice in a cordial manner with decorum based upon my information, based upon my research, based upon my effort, I'm gonna to try to convince them that this is the best way to go for students. And, I, and whatever the decision is, we're gonna uphold the decision and we're going to move forward. And I think as you do that, you will find that among you, you will find more and more common ground because you all got into it for really the same underlying reason. How you get there, you're gonna have different opinions and that's great. That's what representative democracy is. Well, the worst form of government in the world, except for all of the others. It's not always easy, it's not always fast, but it's what, it's what we have and it's what the envy is, frankly, of the world. And I think if we keep that in mind, that we're working as part of a unit and we're working as part of a team, we can make the best outcome for the students. So that brings us to the end of the roles and responsibilities section. Um, does anybody have any questions or want to talk about anything in, in, specifically? A couple of things. Um, yeah. One question uh, was um, provided to me by one of the board members. And the question was, can a single board member give directives to the superintendent or do those directives have to be by board vote? The board. The board has the authority to establish policies that then drive the superintendent's actions. Um, an individual board member, uh, now I will put a caveat on that. A number of school districts um, in response to COVID adopted a policy, um, uh, for example, St. James is an example of one. St. James adopted a policy to avoid the board having to meet repeatedly they adopted a policy in which they invested the board's authority in the president and the superintendent jointly. So the president and the superintendent were making decisions. Bessie recently 
in response to COVID, actually vested Bessie President Holloway with authority to act for the board, subject to ratification by Bessie later. So unless you have a policy that has vested, but board has vested, has delegated to an individual board member, then an individual board member really doesn't have the authority to go on their own independently and direct the actions of any staff. Okay, and then there was another um, issue that came up recently that I was asked to address about um, board members debate during meetings um, and um, the issue of calling the question to stop debate or discussion on an issue. Um, policy, BCB of our own policy adopts Robert's rules of order. And in that same policy, it says each school board member shall be given an opportunity to express without interruption his or her views on any agenda item. The president, however, may stop any discussion that does not apply to the motion last made, and he or she may also stop the discussion of a matter if the school board has previously agreed to confine discussion to a definite period of time, and that time period has been used. So it does give the board president authority to do it under those circumstances, but um, in terms of Robert's rules of order, if a member wants to call the question, it should be done by a motion to call the question and a vote on that motion. Right, well, and again, most ju jurisdictions utilize Robert's rules of order or what, what's more accurate is usually a version thereof. They use Robert's as their sort of core poly uh, meeting procedure and then they modify it as y'all apparently have done through your, and it, and it was modified it to, to meet your circumstance. Um, the biggest issue with board meeting policy is if you don't like the meeting policy, then the board needs to consider changing. Ignoring it makes it almost worthless. Um, and, and it's kind of like, imagine if, you're, if you were playing a game with someone and you y'all had written down the rules and then halfway through the person said, well, we're not going to do rule five anymore. We're just going to do this other thing. And then you lose. Well, then you feel like you lost because they didn't follow the rules. If you have a board policy, now you can always suspend it. The board can vote to suspend a policy. For example, if you have a matter and, and, and you're like, look, you know, our public comment period is three minutes, but uh, I make a motion that for purposes of this meeting, given the, the subject matter, we limit it to two or we expand it to five or 10 and the board votes to do that, that's fine, but those, those actions need to happen as a board. So if you have a policy, and that's why it's important that everybody have the policies, everybody understand the policies, and that the presiding officer abide the policies. I, I've got a client where that, that very issue has come up, where the, the current presiding officer is less willing to gavel a member of the public down when that member of the public is, 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 is a, acting outside of the meeting policies and getting, you know, in other words, they're, they're, they're becoming loud and boisterous or they're, they're using inappropriate language or they're exceeding their allotted time. And the chair is, and frankly, some of the, some of the people are starting to get very frustrated. The chair won't gavel. I mean, that's why they give them a hammer, right? Um, and, and so the chair, it's very difficult to be the chairman the presiding officer of a, of a meeting, because it's, it's up to you to rein in not only your colleagues, but also members of the general public. But if you're doing it in accordance with your documented policy, and you can say, look, sir, I'm not, I am not making the decision to cut you off. Our policy says this. I am obligated to enforce our policy. And if you think our policy needs to be changed, you can speak to any member of this board. Any member of this board can make a proposal to amend that policy. But if, and, and again, it's one of these things where consistency in the chairmanship and enforcing your own policies oftentimes lead to let's violation of those policies because people get used to following those rules. Whereas if the rules are just loosely enforced, then everybody's gonna take their shot of expanding as far as they can. And just, I just had a thing pop up on my computer. The, the school district that was going to delay in, in person instruction just voted, the, the superintendent just announced they were doing that. So uh, that board member was right. She probably should have just let that come out of the superintendent's office. All right. Um, 
I don't know if anybody wanted to take a break. I'm, I'm a lawyer. I can talk forever. Um, and the next item is the public records law. Uh, Stephanie, this would be slide 27. All right. Um, Louisiana has a public records law. And it's interesting because seeking a public record in Louisiana, you're making a request for a public record, not a Freedom of Information Act request. And sometimes that gets confusing with people because people think of FOIA, they think of a freedom of information. They don't think of necessarily public records, which are documents. So uh, revised statute 44.1 et sec, that's and following, is the public records law. Very important, next, uh, slide 28, uh, 44.1, the general definition. Public records are, it's an incredibly broad definition. It's all books and records, writings, accounts, letters, letters, books, maps, drawings, photographs, cards, tapes, recordings, memoranda, papers, regardless of the format in which they're kept, be it electronic or be it paper, if they pertain in any way to the public business. So, you know, if you have a birthday card, on, if the superintendent has a birthday card on, on his desk, that's not a public record. Um, but a copy of the budget sure is. A letter the superintendent has written to a school board member is. A letter a school board member has written to the superintendent most likely is. It's a very, very broad definition. And the courts generally enforce it that way. Next. I put a provision, one of the seminal cases out of Supreme Court is Title Research Corporation versus Rausch. And it cites the constitutional provision from whence the public records law emanates. It says the right of the public to have access to public records is a fundamental right and is guaranteed by the Constitution. Louisiana Article 12, Section 3. The provision of the Constitution must be construed liberally in favor of free and unrestricted access to the records. And th that access can be denied only when a law specifically and unequivocally provides otherwise. Whenever there's doubt as to whether the public has a right to access to certain records, the doubt must be resolved in favor of the public's right to see. To allow otherwise would be an improper and arbitrary restriction on the public's constitutional rights. So if there's a question, the court's going to resolve it in favor of it being a public record. And that's important because sometimes there are things that are in public records that are, are not comfortable for people, but that's not, that's not the standard. Next, the nature of the document is what is key. Not, not, not necessarily even where the document is scored, stored because documents stored or created on a public device are presumed public records. But that doesn't mean that just because a document is not stored on a public device, it's not a public record. For example, if you have a personally owned cell phone and you have text another school board member on a matter of school board business, that text is a public record. And you as the school board member, it's interesting because both the member who sent it and received it both have become custodians of a public record on their private device. You all have an, I presume you all have an OPSB email account. Well, it's very easy to see those public documents. If you transact public business or have public communications about the OPSB business through your own personal Gmail account, that's a public record too. It's the nature of the document. It's not where it's stored. It's not how it was generated. It's the nature of the document. And that's a very important thing to remember because I know we have, I, I laughed 10 years ago, my wife thought texting was ridiculous and she did not need a phone that needed, but now I, I laugh, I said, you text like a 12 year old girl. She's, she's got a bunch of friends and, and they text all the time. Her phone's con constantly going bing, bing. And I chuckle, I'm like, you used to believe texting was a ridiculous way to communicate. Now you do it all the time. Sometimes I tell her, you know, if you're gonna send me seven texts, just pick up the phone and call me because we could have probably got this done a little faster. Now, what's interesting is if she picks them, if there's a phone call between two school board members, the content of that phone call is not a public record. If, there, if there's a text conversation between school, two school board members, that text conversation is a public record. Keep that in mind. I'm not trying to be sneaky, just saying keep it in mind. Um, because you also, 
once it becomes a public record, you trigger a bunch of other issues about whether, when and how it can be destroyed and whether or not it's available to someone who simply makes a request. Um, oftentimes, people are willing to text something that they're maybe not willing to say, and sometimes that causes a text to, to maybe be discourteous or be something that would be embarrassing if it became public. But the fact that it's going to be embarrassing when it becomes public doesn't do anything to stop it from being a public record. Next. Now, there are a, a number of statutory exceptions to the public records law. I'm going to bring up a couple. Under Title 44, Section 4, that's all the exceptions to the public records law. And um, item number 33. It says this chapter to shall not apply to the name, address, and telephone number of any student enrolled in any public elementary or secondary school in the state and a record of a public elementary or secondary school or parish or city school board. Nothing in paragraph A shall prohibit any official or employee of any public school or secondary school, the State Department of Education, or the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education from having access to a student's name, access, address, and telephone number, but only as necessary for the performance of his duties and responsibilities. Now, I didn't, I didn't do a slide on this, and I didn't realize it until this morning I had not, not done this slide. There is a gigantic exception to that. A few years ago, Louisiana Revised Statute 17, Section 3914, often referred to as the Student Data Privacy Law, was passed, which did make it illegal to provide personally identifiable information to anyone who did not have an absolute need to it to provide an educational service to the child, which essentially means, and you check with your administration on this, the Department of Education no longer has a lot of the information that they had five years ago. What they have is they have all that student's information, but it's not tied to that student's name. It's tied to that student's unique identifier number. And when, and when they access it, they have to access it that way. So they might know that there's a fifth grader named Jamal Smith at ABC Elementary. Or they, they, they may know there is a fifth grader, but they won't know his name is Jamal Smith. They'll know his student identification number is one, two, three, four, five. And that's how they'll have to act with it. Um, it, it arose out of a worry that the individual student information, personally identifiable information of students was being shared with too many people. Uh, one of the things I think Ms. Williams has probably dealt with, and I know the, the other uh, attorneys have dealt with, is the uh, memorandums of understanding or contracts whenever you have a vendor that because of the nature of the service they provide, they end up having this student information. And the law now dictates those contracts have to be very narrowly drawn and have to have a bunch of conditions in them to make sure that that vendor is not then using that information or sharing that information outside of their ambit. So even though that is not included in 44.4, it was a subsequent act of the legislature and it is a significant restriction on that information. Next. Um, item 34 in 44.4 is the chapter, the public records law doesn't apply to the social security number of any teacher or school employee employed by a city parish or other local public school board or any non-public school. Um, and then goes on to say nothing in the paragraph shall here prohibit any official or employee at same sort of thing of accessing the information that they need to for their job. Um, for the purpose of the paragraph, school board shall include any city parish or other local public school board and the governing authority of any non-public school. So the legislature have actually extended that to others. Um, because social security numbers we've come to know have become the easiest way to steal somebody's identity. And so uh, use of the social security number has become less uh, a commonplace. You know, that's why students have now have the unique student ID identifier and it's not their social security number. It's a unique number. Uh, next. Now, another major uh, exception to public records is the Louisiana uh, Constitution's right to privacy found in Article 1, Section 5. Um, it says, every person shall be secured as person and property, communications, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches, seizures, or invasions of privacy. So those first two deal more in the criminal world. 
but the invasions of privacy has been interpreted that there's certain information about a public employee that is simply confidential and is not subject to public record. Next. There's an attorney general's opinion that does a real good job of laying out the information in a personnel file in, in its two facets. Our, uh, AGO 090298, name, home address, physical work location, mailing address, salary information, job title, date of hire, length of service, uh, amount of reimbursed expenses, overtime paid, that, that's all public. Now, with one caveat, you can request that certain information about your home address be withheld. But then there's the confidential side, date of birth, age, performance ratings, um, and mandatory and elective payroll deductions of, uh, of the employee. Additionally, would be any medical information. So for example, if an employee is out on sick leave and they send in documentation from the doctor of why they need sick leave, that goes in the confidential portion. Next. It brings up a big issue, and, I, and I'm not sure how detailed your policies get into this, but personnel records really should be segregated into two parts. The personnel record should be segregated into the public, public part and the confidential part, because what you want to avoid is the inadvertent disclosure of confidential information in request to a public records request. So, for example, the resume, that a school system employee submitted when they applied for a job, public. Information about their a medical condition for which they are seeking some sort of work accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act would be confidential. Having that differentiated in that personnel file prevents the inadvertent disclosure of something that shouldn't be disclosed. Now, remember, we are still dealing in the world that it's a, a public record. So you're still dealing in the world that if it's a close call, the court's generally going to fall to the other side. So when you're, and this is more of an administrative staff thing, but just for your education, when the staff is looking at having to disclose a public record, they get a public records request, they're going to look at the elements of that request, what the documents are being requested, and whether or not any documents are exempt. And part of the public records law is that when you respond to the requester, you inform them that, look, we didn't provide this item and this item and this item, and these are the reasons why. Here's the provision of 44.4, or here is 1739.14, or because of Louisiana Constitutional Article 1, Section 5, that it was confidential. So here's the reason we didn't provide that information, and you're required to do in order to fully comply with that public records request. Now, if that person believes that, that that record doesn't fall within that exception, they then have the right to go to court and have the court decide. But that's a balancing test that's gonna to have to be done from an administrative standpoint. Um, and they and Sharonda, they're just gonna blame it on the lawyer, right? <laughs> that's, I tell people, I tell my clients all the time, let me write the letter, let them yell at me. Um, but you know, we're, we're used to that, right? Uh, I tell, I tell people, my, I have two younger siblings, both of whom are medical doctors and were officers in the United States military. Um, I tell people I was the oldest. I was the first child. My parents were 20. They had no idea what they were doing. I probably ate the lead paint chips. That's why I ended up a lawyer and they ended up as doctors. But, all right. Um, I didn't really get too much into the, the process of public records requests because that's not really something the school board handled. That's really that administrative function. But as we talked about earlier, remember, you're creating public records whenever you have electronic communications that are written. Texts, emails, those sorts of things. And understand, you know, I, I try to tell people, don't put anything in writing if you would not be very comfortable with it being on somebody's Facebook page or in a Twitter battle. Because it's probably going to end up where that, that's just the nature of the beast these days. Um, I think there, there, there are actually firms, companies that make public records requests by contract. I've run into them a number of times. Somebody wants to know something, but they don't want the world to know that they're asking. So they hire a company 
There's one company out of New York that I've dealt with several times and literally they make a public records request. Now they're doing it for some client, but they make the public records request and we have to provide the public records to them. And sometimes they make very, very broad requests. Sometimes they make very narrow requests. Sometimes they make requests for three things when it's pretty clear they're really only looking for one. They're just trying to disguise what. But understand when your administration is, is responding to those public records requests, they're doing this uh, with legal advice and trying to stay within the bounds of the law. If you as an individual board member get a public records request for something that's on your private email or something that's on your text, you are still under an obligation to do the same thing. And what you should do, if there's anything that you believe is exempt, you need to try to get legal advice on that issue. Because if you make the decision on your own, um, you're probably looking for a lawsuit. Um, and, and sometimes, like I said, sometimes things are embarrassing. Um, I'm sure you all have heard about uh, the school board member in East Baton Rouge, whose browser history was provided to the newspaper in a public records request. And she called me about it and asked, how could that possibly happen? And I said, were you using their Wi-Fi? She said, well, yeah. And I said, that's how it happened. That browser history became part of the public record because it was on the Wi-Fi. Now, if she had been sitting, if she had not been using their Wi-Fi, then her, brow her, her browser history that didn't have anything to do with the school board meeting probably would not have been a public record. But just be careful. Um, you know, there's the old line from Goodfellas, you know, uh, don't, don't, don't talk if you can whisper, don't whisper if you can nod, don't nod if you can wink. And not that you're trying to be, you know, deceptive. It's just understand that if, if you need to have an uncomfortable conversation with someone, it's usually better to have it as a conversation. Um, and understand if you have it in, an, in a written format through an email or through a text stream, that, that you are creating a public record and you're obligated to maintain that public record. Um, and, and destroying that public record can actually get you in trouble, more trouble than what you would have gotten in had people just seen what you text or what you emailed. Um, Sharonda, were there any other specifics with regard to public records you wanted me to get into? I think you covered um, the issues that we discussed and that I think uh, board members would be most interested in and would need to know um, because as you said it's more of an administrative function in terms of actually producing the records um, but if any board member has any questions about this issue of public records um, please um, let us know now so that it can be addressed if not I think we can move on yeah I'm just so amazing. I explain things so well. Other, either that, or they just are really tired of hearing me talk. Um, and, and I'm going to ask again, to kind of come to the end of the public records. We have two more sections left. Is there anybody that needs to take a break or, or get a cup of coffee? Or if not, I can, like I said, I'm a lawyer. I can talk forever. Uh, I, actually, I actually had a, a friend of mine tell me this morning when I told him what I was doing. He's like, Dan, are you going to be able to limit yourself to three hours? I said, I'll try. All right. Um, okay, now, uh, Stephanie, moving on to uh, slide 36. Um, the top 10 things you need to know about the open meetings law. The open meetings law is found in Title 42. It's Chapter 1.A, uh, Sections uh, 42, 11 through 28. Um, it was recently, I say recently, a number of years ago, it was amended to redesignate the numbers. So you'll have some old case law and some old AG opinions that refer to the old numbers, but they're still valid because they literally just changed the numbers. Um, next. All right. Similarly with the public records law, the open meetings law is going to be construed liberally by the courts. So if there is any question as to whether or not a meeting is to be held in accordance with the standard provisions of the open meetings law, which is live with a quorum, public comment, et cetera, the court's going to generally rely on the meeting should have been open, but the public should have been there. And, that, and, and it gets very difficult, particularly when you deal with, uh, you know, committees of, of boards. Second item, all public bodies shall post a copy of the entire open meetings law. This got passed a number of years ago 
And it was interesting. It was actually when I was still with the police jury association and it was right as I was getting ready to leave and I left and, and I started thinking, I had a number of public clients and I think, you know, I remember, you know, you get those labor law posters that talk about minimum wage and all the stuff that you're required to post. And I'm going, we buy those. So I actually, this, I started doing this a number of years ago. I started creating this. It is an 11 by 17 black and white poster, and it contains the entire chapter of the open meetings law, every word of it. And I started generating them and laminating them originally just for my clients, and then I started having people being interested in them, so I actually started selling them. Y'all will be getting an updated one because there was an amendment to the open meetings law this session. And the police uh, school board association actually buys one for every school board and sends it to you. any school board. If y'all wouldn't need more than that, just let me know and, and we can arrange for that. But everybody's going to get one and it's up to date. It indicates that it's up to date through the 2020 regular and first extraordinary session and it's laminated. So it's easy to post wherever you're having your meetings and it's got, and it satisfies the requirement that the entire law be posted. Um, the main reason I did that is because there's enough stuff that local electric officials can get in trouble for. I didn't need to, to have not having the law posted as one of them. And, it, and what encouraged me to do this is I actually went to a meeting of a public body and they had a big glass case right outside of their meeting chamber. And it's where they posted the agenda. And then I noticed they had this multi-page printed black and white document stapled and posted inside their glass case. And I looked at it and it was, it was the entire open meetings law, but it was like they had printed it out on eight and a half by 11 paper. So it was like seven or eight pages. They were stapled together and they were enclosed in a locked glass cabinet. So while technically they in fact had the public or the open, the open meetings law posted, nobody could read it except for that first page because <laughs> you couldn't get in the glass case. And, and I started thinking to myself, that's probably not what that statute intends. So I came up with this and, um, and I, I have to say, because the legislature added a section this year, the font got really, really small, but you can still read it and it's there. Uh, now I have one client that every, whenever I, whenever I, they, I give them one of these, they actually have them, me send it to them in a PDF they actually print it on a 13 by 19 page so it's a little bit larger so it's easier for people to read and they actually frame it and put it up in the back of their council chamber so that's how they satisfy the law but it is important that you have it posted um, and if you don't like i said you'll have a poster coming to you shortly from the school boards association and um and you should have the one from last year because i think they all had them no yawning <laughs> next um not only the board, but also the committees are subject to open meetings law. We get this a lot. Every committee created by the board is in fact itself a public body under the definition of the open meetings law. So each of your committees is required to follow the same open meetings law provisions with regard to notice, with regard to public comment, and uh, with regard to minutes. Now, you don't necessarily publish them, but you do have to you have to operate that meeting of that committee as if it is its own public body. Sometimes people, they, and that, that gets very difficult, particularly if you have small committees, because let's say you appoint a committee of three. Well, if two of those committee members go to lunch and while they're waiting for their food to arrive, they go, well, you know, remember the thing that came up at the committee meeting the other day? You know, let's talk that through again. What have they done? They've just undertaken the discussion of a matter under the jurisdiction of their committee, and they are a quorum of that committee, but yet they did not post a notice of that meeting. The public had no opportunity to participate and to attend and to view their deliberations and their discussion. So they probably just inadvertently violated the open meetings law. So keep that in mind that when you're operating your committees, try to follow the rules that you've set forth for the public body and to make sure those rules are in line with the open meetings law. 
next, uh, know, know the definition of a meeting. And this is interesting. The definition of a meeting re refers to when it is convened by the public body. So, in other words, the school board convenes a meeting of the school board. The committee convenes a committee, a committee of, the, uh, of, it, of its members. But if a majority of the members of the Orleans Parish School Board attend the Louisiana School Boards Association convention, well, y'all did not convene that meeting. That meeting was convened by the LSBA, their private entity. Just like if, if a, a quorum of the school board happened to show up at a football game or at a Mardi Gras ball, y'all did not convene that meeting. So, because some people get confused and they think, oh, wait a minute, there's a quorum of us here, one of us has to leave. I, I dealt with an issue a number of years ago, it was in a police jury and they, they, were, they were in a, a bit of a panic because there was a big Knights of Columbus function and they had seven members on the police jury and three of them were there and a fourth member of the police jury walked into the Knights of Columbus function and says, hey guys, how y'all doing? And the parish attorney was there and he panicked and he was like, oh my gosh, one of y'all has to leave. Otherwise we're in violation of the law. So, well, no, <laughs> it doesn't say you can't have a quorum there. It says they can't convene themselves. Now, they also can't use that as an opportunity to say, well, hey, let's talk about some stuff. Talk about the Mardi Gras. Talk about football. Talk about, you know, gardening. Talk about your favorite recipe. If there's a majority of you there, stay away from public business. If you do that, if you understand the difference between those, I had a circumstance that actually went to court not long back. And it was a situation where an individual wanted to know something. He had, a, he had an issue. So he called what he called a town meeting. And he invited a whole bunch of elected officials of various, from, from various entities and members of the public, and they had this meeting. And it turns out a majority of the police jury showed up. And there was a question as to whether or not that was a public meeting. But it wasn't, it wasn't convened as a public meeting. They took no action on the public thing. And the vast majority of the people that were invited had nothing to do with the public body. It was all being led by one individual. So a town hall meeting led by a single person is probably not, but if you, but if you convene a public meeting, if y'all call it, then it probably is. So just be careful on that. And again, if you're, if you're ever, if you ever wonder whether or not you have a lawyer, and the cool thing about having a lawyer is if the lawyer says, I think you're okay, that ultimately benefits you in the, in the wrong, long end, wrong, uh, the, in, the, in the end, because you're not gonna be subject to the civil penalty if you get that lawyer's advice. Next, number five, the public comment period. School boards have had a public comment period longer than everybody else. Um, y'all had, if you'll, if you'll look in the law, y'all have a public comment period that was created before everyone else's. It was in place. And it's interesting because y'all had a public comment period in place years and years ago, back when I was a staffer at the legislature. Everybody else got a public comment period thanks to uh, a, a Representative Pepe Bruno getting a call from a constituent saying he was at a little recreation district meeting and they wouldn't let him talk. And so Mr. Bruno created public comment period for everybody else. Um, one of the things you get to do with regard to your public comment period is set reasonable rules. You set the time frame. You can limit people to discussing matters only on the agenda, which I strongly, strongly urge. And we'll get into that in a second. And also apply your decorum rules to them. Because you will find that if, and if you, if, if as the chair of the meeting, you abide those public comment rules, you will find the public will begin more and more to adhere to those rules. And you'll have a, a less of the lack of decorum. And I understand some people say, well, that's my right of free speech. Well, you don't really have a right to cuss somebody out in a meeting. And so set up your rules and abide by them. Now, the hard thing for like, am I talking about a chairman? The hard thing is if that member of the public is in an improper manner attacking a board member that, he, that is your political rival, your gut instinct is to let it kind of go. But as the chair, your obligation is to abide by your own public comment period rules and, and address that. I also tell people public comment is just that. It's public comment. It's not Q&A. 
It is not a circumstance where a member of a public has the right to stand at the podium and say, I'm going to stand here until you answer my question. It's public comment. And it's, and it's done before you take action, because the whole point of it is it's supposed to provide information that you as the public body are going to use ostensibly in making your decision. So you know what members of the public who've appeared at the meeting who have sent in their uh, comments electronically, you know what they think, what they want you to do before you vote. Now, whether you're gonna vote in accordance with what they ask you to is, is immaterial, you're still the one with the vote. I also tell public members of public bodies, avoid getting in an argument with the public comment. It is comment. Let them say what they have to say. I have one uh, public body, and, and it's funny, I, I kind of sit behind them in my role, and the gentleman who sits almost right in front of me, they have electronic, they have an electronic system, and you, you touch, it's a touch screen on their computer when they need to speak. And invariably, there'll be someone during public comment will say something that will aggravate him, and he will almost break his screen hitting his button, which really, I tell my wife, it's like an iPhone. All you have to do is touch it. It's not how hard you press it. And, and I try to tell him, I'm like, you'll have your say, because public comment happens, then the debate at the board happens, then you vote. Well, if you, need to if you feel like, as a, public, uh, as a member of the body, that you need to respond to an individual comment, you can. But it's usually best to let the public comment take place. Let everybody have their say. Then you're done. Then if you feel like that someone has said something that's factually incorrect, you can correct them. Now, again, I would urge you to use the same decorum you would expect them to use with you. And that is, you know, you don't say, Mr. Johnson just lied to everybody in this room. You say, my information is that the facts are actually this. And so that, that's the information that I have, and this is where I got that information. And I would ask the board members to make your decision based upon this, because I think this is the more accurate information. Again, one of those is boring, one of those is gonna get lots of clicks. Um, but again, public comment is not a Q and A, it's not a debate. The board members debate and then vote. The public is providing you information. They're providing you their view that you then use as part of the corpus of information to then make inform your vote and i think if you'll remember that and just sit back and sometimes it's hard because sometimes they say stuff that just gets so under your skin but again if you show the decorum not to fight back right then you'll oftentimes avoid something spinning out of control because i've seen circumstances where a member of the public and a member on a public body will just start going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and pretty soon the meeting has lasted seven and a half hours and you're halfway through the agenda. Next, executive session. There are a number of items specifically set forth in the, the law with regard to executive session. Executive session is a circumstance where you can have a discussion outside of the view of the public is an it is an exception to the general rule that your debate and discussion and it takes place in the public view now there are certain items that are specifically set forth in uh, 42 or uh, 42 section 17a there's essentially 10. one of them that everybody's familiar with has to do with the discussion of the mental, physical uh, health or professional competence of a person. Now remember, it's written much more narrowly than many people interpret. It's not all personnel matters. It's not that all personnel matters necessarily go to executive session. It's when it falls within that discussion. Also, as part of that, in order for you to go into executive session, you first have notified the individual that you're going to be talking about at least in writing at least 24 hours before the meeting exclusive of saturday sundays and legal holidays notified them that the board intends to go into executive session to discuss them that individual has the right to object now if they object it doesn't mean y'all can't talk about them it means y'all can't talk about them in executive session because much of what you would talk about in executive session may be confidential information. But if that employee objects and says no, 
I object to you going to executive session to discuss me, then your alternative is to discuss them in open session. And they essentially have waived their right to the confidentiality of that information because they had the opportunity for that information not to become public. Now, it's funny because I've also heard people misinterpret that as that an employee can demand that something be done in executive session. That's simply not true. Now, if you're not going to go into executive session, be careful that you are curtailing your discussion to things that are not confidential. And that's where it gets a little sticky. In other words, if you're going to discuss someone and, and there's not going to be the discussion of anything that's confidential, that can happen in open session. If you're going, if the conversation is necessarily going to involve confidential information, my recommendation would be that you plan to do it in executive session. If that person says, no, I want you to talk about me in front of God and everybody and go do it there. They also can't demand that you do it one way or the other. They also can't object as a means of preventing you from ever talking about them. That's not, that's not how that exception works, but it is very important that you meet those strictures. Also to go into executive session, it has to be an agenda item. There has to be a motion to go into executive session. That motion has to be subject to public comment. And then that motion has to pass by two thirds vote of the members present in order to go into executive session. Now, so those are all the strictures you have. And so if you have a situation where there is not a two thirds vote, maybe just a mere majority vote to go into executive session, you can't go into executive session. The other item that's used a lot with regard to executive session is there is a provision that allows you to discuss litigation um, and or union negotiations when discussing it in, in open would impair your bargaining power. For example, there's a lawsuit and the, your attorney is going to come in and tell you what they think the suit is potentially worth and what they think they might be able to settle it for and make a recommendation that you give them some authority to try to settle it. Well, if you do that in open session and your attorney says, yeah, I think this case is probably worth about $50,000, but I think I can get them to take 25 if y'all give me that authority. What's the odds that that plaintiff attorney is going to take 25 if he knows that you've already said to the world and everybody, the case is worth 50. So, but when you're going to executive session for that particular reason, there's a special notice provision that says that you have to identify the litigation you're going in there to talk about. And so that can get a little bit sticky because sometimes that plan attorney, he's going to know that y'all are talking about his lawsuit. Now he doesn't have a right to be in there, but he's going to know that y'all are in there talking. Also in executive session, one of the, the last no, item number 10, it's any, any other, for any other reason authorized by law. And this one has got some jurisprudential interpretation to include receiving attorney-client privileged information. And by that, I mean this. If y'all are in a contract with someone and the board would like the board attorney to know, look, how can, what are our options for terminating that contract? The board attorney can actually, y'all can go into executive session to discuss where the board attorney can render their legal opinion, these are your options under the contract. And this, would, this is what would happen if you took this action or this action or this action. Now, those are all attorney-client privileged communications. And again, the Orleans Parish School Board is entitled to attorney-client privilege information with their attorney. Again, like I spoke earlier, it's the board's privilege, not the individual members. So if your board attorney comes in and explains what the strengths and weaknesses are under that contract, rendering that legal opinion, be careful that you don't go out and release that information to the other contracting party because it may put you in an adverse position. So those are probably the three that would be most likely uh, to, to discuss. There also, there also can be uh, discussions of certain student matters in executive session. But again, when you schedule something for executive session, it is my practice to advise my clients to list 
which paragraph in section 17 they're relying upon to go into executive session and make sure that if that particular provision has a special notice requirement that that notice requirement is in fact met now once you get into executive session understand all executive session is for is discussion you can't poll each other you can't vote uh, you can't do a straw poll you can't go well you know what do y'all want to do most executive session items almost necessitate having an open session item related to that so that after you've gotten the information you can go take an action now a lot of people say well well yeah but if we're going to go authorize him you know uh, give give the attorney fifty thousand dollars worth of authority but direct him to start at 25 well nobody's going to take the 25 so what i'll normally do is i'll normally set up a res that the board adopts a resolution to authorize their counsel to enter into settlement, nego settlement negotiations in accordance with the attorney's recommendation issued to the board in executive session. That way you're not disclosing what the privileged communications is about that litigation, but you are authorizing the person to go take action on your behalf. And that, but that's when the action has to be taken after you come back into open session. And just be careful that, that you, uh, to avoid kind of doing that, that straw poll in executive session. Next, notice and agendas. Um, your, uh, the agenda for a meeting is required to be posted not less than 24 hours prior to the meeting, exclusive of Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays. That was actually a fairly, uh, only a few years ago they add that provision because used to be you could, you, could, you could notice a meeting on, on a Saturday for a Monday, um, but you can't really do that anymore. You have to, it's exclusive Saturday, Sundays, and executive set. And it's interesting, um, my high school classmate, Neil Abramson, uh, uh, was, was one of the ones who came up with that when he was in the legislature, oddly enough. Um, also, the agenda is supposed to identify each agenda item with reasonable specificity. The whole point is to let the public know the subject matter of what's going to be undertaken. And it's interesting because it's one of these issues where it's why you need to keep people on the agenda item in public comment. Because if you let if you let public comment become just and and, I, and I've seen this in a lot of people just general comments from the public. Invariably, what happens is someone comes up and says, "I don't think y'all know about it, but over at Exeter High School." you know, the, the computer lab has a big old roof leak and they can only use half of it. And my kid goes there and I can't believe y'all aren't fixing it. Not that's y'all should, y'all need to do something about it. Y'all need to do something about it tonight. And, and all of a sudden you're talking about something that's not on your agenda and the incentive for somebody to hurry up and let's, let's vote on it. They're going to essentially encourage you to get off the agenda. Or even when someone comes up and brings up a whole policy matter, says, you know what? I just don't think that we need to have any school mascots named after animals because that's just cruel. And we need to, all the schools need named after colors. We should have the reds and the blues and, and, and the browns and that's it. And we, and, and the only problem is if you undertake that matter without having done notice, then there may be people in the public who would have come to the meeting if they knew that's what y'all were going to discuss. So understand, Stopping one person from having from from launching you into a discussion on something that's not on your agenda actually is a way to protect the rights of the people who are sitting at home who had they known that's what you were going to discuss, they would have come. Now, the uh, leads next leads to item number eight, and that is adding items to your agenda. And it's interesting because the law actually says in order to amend the agenda, it takes a unanimous vote. Um, but the, that's all that's all been interpreted to mean adding stuff to the agenda. Um, deferring a matter or withdrawing a matter or tabling a matter, you, you, you can just move on past it. But if you're going to add an item to your agenda that's not on the posted agenda, you need to make sure that that item has been sufficiently noticed to the public. Um, and if if something comes up, you do have the ability to add an item to the agenda, but this is the process. First, there has to be a motion to add it to the agenda. That motion has to be seconded and has to receive a unanimous vote of the members present. 
So an abstention kills a motion to amend. Now, if that person leaves the room and is absent, it's the mo those that are present, but you need a unanimous vote. Before you vote on the motion to, uh, to add something to the agenda, that motion has to be subject to public comment. The people get to say whether they believe that subject matter should or should not be added to the agenda. If it receives a unanimous vote and is added to the agenda after public comment, then when you get to that agenda item, you then take that agenda item up in itself. In other words, the original vote to add it to the agenda is not the vote on the agenda item. You got to do it twice. And this is where it gets really complex. If in the meeting someone says, look, I think we need to go into executive session to discuss this threat of a lawsuit that we just got from ABC Incorporated over that contract that we have with them. This is what would have to happen. One, you'd have to have a motion to add that executive session and action on the, uh, the, uh, on, on directing legal counsel with regard to that contract, you have to add those items to your agenda. That motion would have to be, to, would have to be subject to public comment. You'd have to get a unanimous vote to add those items to your agenda. Then once added to the agenda to go into executive session, you'd have to have a motion to go into executive session, which motion would be subject to public comment and would require a two thirds vote. You would go into executive session, you would come back out, then to take action on what you want to direct your lawyer to do, you'd have to have a motion to take that action. That would be subject to public comment, and then it would take a majority vote to pass that motion. So if, if, if you can avoid adding things to your agenda, that's the best way to do it. But understand, adding things to your agenda sometimes is necessary because there are sometimes things that, that come up and you need to address them before you can have your next regular schedule meeting. And adding something to the agenda oftentimes is more efficient than saying, well, look, we'll just have to deal with that. We'll just have to call a special meeting two days from now because we know that that, that gets difficult to do. So sometimes it's necessary, but understand it's a very, and what I tell the presiding officers is you need to whip the little document out and, and start going through it and start checking off motion, second, public comment, unanimous vote, motion, second, it, just to keep you in line. And next, that has to do, and, and now your written minutes will reflect, reflect each of the things you do. One of the things about written minutes is they can either be verbatim or they can be a summary. I talk with school board secretaries a lot about this. Unless you're going to verbatim and understand you're publishing those in the official journal. So your official journal would absolutely love if your minutes were verbatim because they get paid to publish them. But summary minutes, I try to urge, make it just a summary of what took place. Not a summary what, of what individual people said. And, I, and in my experience, what, you, what oftentimes happens is when a secretary tries to summarize that, you know, uh, Ms. Jackson made the argument, da, 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 and does like a little three or four sentence summary of Ms. Jackson's argument. Invariably, there will be a time when you're getting ready to approve the minutes and Ms. Jackson says, wait, 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 I think that is a, I think that's an inaccurate summary of what I said during the meeting. By the same token, when you start putting in individual comments, then you put yourself in the box of individual board members coming in and saying, look, I remember at the meeting, I said, this will come back to bite us one day. And I want that in the minutes. I want that comment in the minutes. Well, that's a verbatim comment. And, and so you, you get into this sort of rabbit hole. I've even had circumstances where I get a call from a public body secretary who says, Mr. Garrett, this is the problem. During the meeting, Mr. Smith said X, and apparently he misspoke, he said, and what he meant to say was Y. And so he wants me to put what he meant to say in the minutes instead of what he said in the minutes. And that's why I'm saying, that's why I've always advised you, avoid trying to summarize what anybody said. Summarize the action. 
there was a motion to adopt a resolution to establish the to, to set the opening date for school. Public comment was received. There was debate. The vote was. That's a summary of the action. Man, uh, Sharonda, do y'all stream your meetings live? Yes, they're televised. And do y'all record them and keep them? Like people can come back and look at them afterwards? You can, yes, you can get them. Yeah, because that's, that's, it's becoming more and more common. And, and frankly, in the COVID world, what has happened is that people have realized that now if somebody has a cell phone and you've got a decent cell signal, you can just broadcast the thing on Facebook. My old pastor is actually the pastor at uh, Rain United Methodist Church now. And I've enjoyed being able to listen to his sermons because in the Methodist Church, they, they move your pastor every so often. And I've really enjoyed his sermons. And so I've been listening to his sermons on Facebook Live. Ten years ago, when people started talking about forcing public bodies to broadcast or stream their meetings live on the Internet, everybody freaked out because it was going to be so expensive. But with the advancing technology in the last 10 years, honestly, you can do it with a cell phone. You can literally set a cell phone up in the back of the room and record the whole meeting live. Um, and Zoom, same sort of thing. But um, so if you're already going to have a record, and most school boards, even before they were streaming them and recording them, they were recording the audio. You already have a record of what an individual person said. You don't need to incorporate that into your minutes. Your minutes are essentially a summary of the actions of the body. And then you publish those minutes in the official journal. That lets people know what actions you took and by what vote and who, how people voted, which is what the public is entitled to know from the minutes standpoint. Again, the minutes are a record of what you did or didn't do, not who said what to whom. And so, um, and I know it's, 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 a, it's kind of a bad habit to get out of. And you almost have to go one way or the other, because if you, if you kind of try to go halfway and sort of pseudo summarize, you're going to run into that situation where somebody objects to the way you summarize their comments. And they're going to say, well, if you're going to say what I said, then here, here are the exact words I said. Um, and, and honestly, I've actually had situations where I've had a, a secretary receive a phone call going, look, um, I, was, I was looking through the minutes you sent to us, and it said the vote on that was seven to two, and that I voted no. I didn't vote. I don't remember voting no. And I need you to change that. It needed to be eight to one, because my district would not want me to have voted. I don't believe I voted no. And, and I've tried to tell the secretaries, that's, go back to your tape and tell the person you can't change it. Uh, that, that's not, you know, un, un, interestingly, the legislature does have a process to do that, by the way, if you've ever seen them. If, if the legislature votes on a matter and someone can come up during that same session of the legislature and make a motion to change their vote, as long as it doesn't change the outcome. Uh, Y'all don't have that, thank goodness. But again, make sure, again, and you can establish that by policy of how your minutes are set forth. And again, I think you will find that if you limit your minutes to a true summary of what took place, and not trying to summarize what people said, I think you're going to find that your minutes are more are actually more informative, more accurate, and will cost you a whole lot less less to uh, to publish. And finally, enforcement and penalties. Under the Open Meetings Law, the individual members of the public body who knowingly and willfully violate the Open Meetings Law are subject to a court-imposed penalty of five hundred dollars. That was recently increased from $100. Now, I mentioned uh, Sharonda a couple of times because there's jurisprudence that says that if a public body inquires to their legal counsel as to whether or not they are in compliance with the open meetings law, and the legal counsel says, I believe you are, then even if a court were to ultimately say you were not, you, the individual members are not subject to the $500 civil penalty because since they were relying on counsel, it's not a knowing and willful violation. So I just made Sharonda's life a little harder because now they go, are you sure we're in compliance with the open meetings law? And, and, and I can tell you the stuff we're getting ready to get into, it's, it's, it, it's getting a little bit more difficult to answer those questions, but it should be a question that's asked. Um, also, a court can nullify your actions taken 
in an open meeting that was invited that are in a meeting that was held in violation of the open meetings law. Uh, they can all the court can also issue uh, an injunction enjoining you from violating that again. And if you violate that injunction, now you're in contempt of court. And they, the judge can technically kind of put you in jail for that. So uh, it's very important to rely on your legal guidance and try to stay as best you can within the open meetings law. Next, above all, remember what item number one was, and that was the law is going to be interpreted liberally. So if it's a close call, my advice is always to err on the side of making it public, even if you maybe didn't technically have to, if it's a close call, it's gonna keep you out of trouble. Now, that all that being said, next, slide 48, COVID-19 and the virtual me and virtual meetings. Um, governor issued his first proclamation um, related to COVID-19, in which he granted the ability to conduct public meetings in a virtual format as opposed to live in person. And since then, the law has been in flux. Next. The original proclamation 30 JBE 2020 allowed public bodies to have virtual meetings to avoid having a meeting in public, but with this condition. Before any meeting conducted pursuant to this section, the, and it was state agency, political, the public body shall first provide a written certification that it will otherwise be unable to operate due to quorum requirements. And if you'll recall back in uh, March when the governor issued Proclamation 30 2020, the meetings limit was 10. As an example, the, your, your colleagues across the lake in St. Tammany have a 15 member school board. So their quorum is eight, the superintendent's nine, and the other necessary staff that necessarily have to be at a school board meeting, there was no way they could get, they, they could really have a meeting with a quorum in the room. They certainly couldn't have a meeting of the entire board and still be in compliance with the 10 person. Now, as we have sort of walked our way through the pandemic, those have been changing. Um, I am very much a belt and suspenders kind of lawyer in the sense that I have always tried to live by the liberal construction issue. And if there's any question as to whether or not, not one, of, one of the entities that I represent individually could have a meeting virtually, um, I, I, I urge them to have it otherwise. And particularly as the group, the meeting requirements got larger and larger. So it becomes a whole lot easier to make sure you have a quorum and make sure you can in fact operate. Um, but again, every one of those circumstances is going to be very fact specific. And every one of those circumstances, I urge that every public body should follow the advice of their council. So for the public bodies where I am the direct council, I'm the for example, I'm the counsel for the Plaquemines Parish Council. I am the parish attorney for West Feliciana Parish. So, and I have a number of other entities where I directly provide them legal advice. My advice to my client may not be the advice any other lawyer gives to any other client. And that's okay, because the law is clearly in flux on this issue, particularly when you consider that the governor has repeated this same language in section two of all of his subsequent proclamations. Next, and actually, let's see. So, proclamations all the way through the 184 JBE 2020, which was effective on June 26th through July 24th, which is the one we're still under as modified by his recent one, but this section is related back to there, contained that same language. The reason that becomes fairly interesting is this. Next, Act 302 of the 2020 regular session enacted Louisiana Revised Statute 42, Section 17.1. Remember I said I had to update the open meetings law poster because the legislature actually added a whole new section to the open meetings law and it's all about virtual meetings. In fact, it's exceptions for meetings during a gubernatorial, gubernatorially declared disaster or emergency. It, it took effect on June 12th because the statute, the act said it was effective on signature of the governor. Okay. 
So at that point, we were under the prior, not 84, we were under the prior proclamation. Then this statute passed. Now what's interesting, this statute actually has a provision in it that says that it's also suspending the enforcement mechanisms, the nullification provision and the civil penalty for any meetings held not in compliance with 17.1. But it doesn't really speak to the other enforcement mechanisms such as declaratory judgment or the injunction. So we were under a provision that was under a proclamation, then this statute became effective. Then, and, and, the, and the limitations it has, it, it limits virtual meetings to three topics or three subject matters. One, you, have to be, you have to comply with one of these. Matters that are directly related to the public body's response to the disaster or emergency and are critical to the health, safety, or welfare of the public. Next. Matters that if they are delayed will cause uh, curtailment of vital public services or severe economic dislocation and hardship. And C, next, matters that are critical to the continuation of the business of the public body and that are not able to be postponed to a meeting held in accordance with the other provisions of this chapter due to a legal requirement or other deadline that cannot be postponed or delayed by the public body. Now that is far restrictive, far more restrictive than what the governor had put in his proclamation because his proclamation merely didn't, didn't limit the, the subject matters or the topics of your meetings. It only spoke to, you can have them if you needed, if you couldn't get a quorum. If you had that certification, you couldn't get a quorum. So again, so then Act 302 on June 12th, but then as I, as I spoke a moment ago, on the 24th, the governor issued 84 2020. That's after June 12th. So then it's created the legal question of do you have your meetings in accordance with 84 JBE 2020, or do you have your virtual meetings in accordance with 4217.1, which took effect on June 12th? Did the 84 2020 have the effect of suspending 17.1? And I will tell you with great confidence. I don't know. And I used to have a professor at LSU, Professor Pugh, in my evidence class, and he was famous for it. He asked, he would ask these questions. And if you said, I don't know, he would say, and you say it with such authority, I believe you. But the question is, it's, it's created this legal quandary. Um, the governor will be issuing a new executive order in a couple of days. Um, we have reached out to the governor about this quandary that it's put all of these lawyers in because lawyers don't like uncertainty um, or we love uncertainty. I'm not sure, or it's both. And to see that the governor in his, in his new executive order can potentially clarify this issue because it does put people in a, in a tough spot and it, it puts them in a, in a position of not knowing which of those two provisions they should be following. Or is it a combination? So hopefully we can get some from some language from the governor's office in the new proclamation, um, and it'll give more guidance. Because right now, really, you can make a very valid legal argument for either one. Now, if that's not enough on your lawyer's plate as to what you can and cannot do with regard to meetings, um, Stephanie, if you can go to slide 55, Silver versus Alexandria. Silver versus City of Alexandria, case number one, colon 20 dash CD 0068, U.S. District Court, Western District of Louisiana, issued on July 6, 2020. Next. In that case, the court ruled that a member of a public body, in that case, the Alexandria City Council, established that he suffered from a disability and met, that met the threshold of the Americans with Disabilities Act and that that disability impaired his ability to attend live city council meetings and that the city had the technology to allow his virtual attendance and voting at that meeting and that such virtual attendance was a reasonable accommodation 
to which he was legally entitled under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and because it's a federal law, it supersedes the state open meetings law. Yeah, it was, it was pretty, I mean, it, all the buzz for the handful of us that do this all the time. And it is, it's very dramatic. And the reason it's very dramatic is because, interestingly enough, this city council member had actually asserted that he should be able to participate virtually back in February before COVID even really became a thing because he's very elderly. He had fallen and broken his elbow. And because of his underlying medical conditions and his recovering from his elbow, his doctor basically told him he had to stay in bed at home. And so he took the position, he should still get to participate in, as, a, as an elected city councilman in the meetings. And he wanted to be on the phone and be allowed to make motions and to vote. Because understand, you could always have appeared at the meeting you could listen in on a phone. You could listen in on a Zoom call. It's just under the open meetings law. You had you couldn't vote because all votes had to be via voce. You had to be live in person. Well, now a federal judge has said not so much. Now, it's interesting because that case is a federal district court case. It is my appreciation that that the city has not appealed that decision which means we are very unlikely to get a court of appeal ruling on that. But unlike in state court, federal court, trial court opinions are citable jurisprudence. Next. Well, let's back up one, I'm sorry. Go back. So this, is the, this now poses yet another question. When can a member of a public body, based upon that ruling, assert that because of a disability, they should be able to attend? Now, it's interesting because the court also mentioned in the, in the ruling that it would also apply to claims under the Federal Rehabilitation Act. The difference between ADA and rehabilitation has to do with more permanent and more temporary, but the same threshold provides, and that is if a member has a medical issue that, or, or some form of disability that prevents them from being there live, they may be in a position where they can demand a reasonable accommodation given that most public bodies have now figured out how to let people participate virtually, either through Zoom or Teams or just on a, on a conference call line, there may be a legal requirement to allow them to do so. Now, does that necessarily mean that any member who wants to attend virtually has a right to do so? No. The court made it clear that they were talking about disability. The court actually went one step further and said they were limiting their ruling to only being applicable during the state of emergency dealing with COVID-19. But the court did get, went on to say that once this pandemic has resolved and we're no longer under a state of emergency, the court would be willing to hear additional evidence on whether or not this accommodation would be applicable outside of a state of emergency in a general circumstance where an elected official has some form of medical condition or disability that impairs their ability to appear live, they may be able under the ADA or the Rehabilitation Act to demand a reasonable accommodation by participating virtually. Um, it's interesting because at the legislature when they were debating what became Act 302, at one point there was an effort to actually allow the state bond commission to start meeting virtually all the time. We just put that in the state law and there was a little bit of debate back and forth uh, about that, and that ended up not happening. But I suspect that as the public becomes more and more in tune, there may be more efforts to expand the circumstances in which virtual meetings are permitted. And in this situation, when a particular elected official may demand um, to be able to participate virtually. And I mean, I've been doing this long enough that I've seen policy change based upon somebody getting sick. Um, there is a there is a school board that I'm aware of that has an even numbered body. It's an even numbered body, and they were at loggerheads over an issue. One of the board members had a heart attack, and was in the hospital. Their regular board meeting came around, and the matter was resolved on a vote of four to three. Now, had Silver versus Alexandria been out there, that board member who was in the hospital recovering from his heart attack 
may have been able to insist that he participate virtually and that vote be four to four again. It's something I think that we will all have to deal with as we move into sort of the new normal. But um, like I said, it will be interesting to see if the governor addresses uh, Act 302 and 17.1 in his new uh, executive order so that we all have a bit more clarity and we're not guessing as much. All right, let's see. Now moving into the, the last element. Uh, the, oh, first of all, were there any other questions, Sharonda, that you want me to address with regard to open meetings? Could, could you touch on briefly the issue of a walking forum and group emailing? Sure. Um, and actually, it, the, there is an issue, a, a, a term of art, a rolling or a walking quorum. And essentially, it is a circumstance in which, in order to avoid having to have an, a public meeting, a public body purposefully meets in smaller groups of less than a quorum of the public body. And you have a situation where member A and B and C and D meet. And then Mr. D and Ms. C leave the room and Mr. E and Ms. F come in the room and they have the same discussion. And they, and they keep doing that so that, they, you know, it's a, it's a nine member body. So as long as they have four, they don't have a quorum, but they do that for the purpose of not having to have that discussion in public. The courts have ruled that that is in fact a violation of the open meetings law. Again, it's under that very liberal construction in favor of it being open. And that issue comes up a lot, again, when we use texts and emails. If you have a text string that includes a quorum of the school board, and you start making decisions or polling people through that, that can be considered a violation of the open meetings law because you're in effect deliberating outside of an open meeting. Now, same thing can happen with email. Reply all is the bane of a lawyer's existence. If I send an email, because there's nothing wrong with an individual board member sending an email saying, I don't know about y'all, but there is no way that I'm gonna vote to change the team colors for the high school that I graduated from, period. If I write one more sentence, it says, what do y'all think? And then I start getting reply alls from all the school board members. Now we're having a discussion about a matter that's going to be on our agenda. It's a matter over which we need to be meeting in public. We are violating the open meetings law. There has been a significant amount of debate and no, there's some AG opinions, but there's no firm jurisprudence yet, but it, in a room, in a public meeting, school board member A texts school board number B, how are you going to vote? School board member B says, I don't know, how are you going to vote? School board, we should vote the same way. I know, but I just can't figure out which way. And y'all start having a conversation. There is an argument that that conversation is a violation of the open meetings law because y'all are debating the matter in a public meeting, but you're doing it outside of the public's view. Now, as a practical matter, if two school board members get up in the middle of a meeting and go in the back to get a fresh cup of coffee, have they ever had a discussion back there about what they were gonna do? Likely so. But that's why the courts are having trouble with that one. But with the text streams, where you're effectively debating something or polling members or with emails where you're basically polling members, those are likely going to be deemed to be violations of meeting law. And again, if the reason you're meeting with four people instead of five today and with a different set of four people tomorrow is so that you don't have to have an open meeting, the court is probably going to rule that the purpose of that action was to evade the open meetings law, and then they're gonna feel free to take one of those enforcement actions. So you just have to be careful about that. And again, doesn't mean that four of you can't go have lunch together of a, of a nine member board. It just means, and it doesn't even mean the four of y'all can't, if four of y'all wanna go and talk about how y'all are gonna vote, that's perfectly fine. 
what you need to do though is to go okay now uh uh you know woody you need to leave now because uh miss jackson's she, she'll she'll be here in about five minutes and and we need to we need to loop her in because now instead of four we're talking five and you're effectively evading the open meetings law so just be careful um and and, and recognize that if it's a close call the court's going to rule against you all right any other questions That's all I had. All right. Okay. Now, the last little bit, um, and uh, Stephanie, uh, slide 57, we're going to touch on the Louisiana Code of Governmental Ethics for Public Servants. Um, first of all, a public servant. Uh, public employees, elected officials, and people who are appointed to various state and local boards and commissions are all public servants. Uh, so, and it, so it do, and, and it, and it doesn't matter whether you're paid or not. And it doesn't matter if you were elected or not. It matters if you are. Um, now, public employees, anyone who is an administrative officer or official of a governmental entity who is not filling an elective office, because a lot of people say, oh, well, I'm not an elected official because I was appointed to my seat on the school board. Well, but you were appointed to an elective office, and as soon as you get appointed, you become an elected official, not an employee. Okay. Anyone whom an elected official appoints to serve as a member of the agency or as an employee of the agency when the elected official is acting in an official capacity. Anyone engaged, next, anyone engaged in the performance of a governmental function, I put an asterisk by that one because we're gonna talk about that a little bit, or anyone under the supervision or authority of an elected official or, or another employee of a governmental organization. Now, the reason I put an asterisk by anyone engaged in the performance of a governmental function is because you can actually be a public employee without having a public paycheck. The Board of Ethics took the issue up several years ago and looked at two law firms. One law firm was hired by LSU to provide legal services to the university. And the Board of Ethics said, no, they're just a vendor. That's a private law firm who's a vendor providing legal services. Another law firm had a contract with the Road Home Program. That law firm was actually providing evaluations and making decisions on road home applications. And the Board of Ethics said that the members of that law firm, to the extent that they were performing a core governmental function, of, that they, they were, in fact, public employees and subject to the code of governmental ethics. They were public servants. In the school world, that became evident next. Um, ethics opinion 2015-614, uh, requested by then Senator Ed Murray, held that officers employees of charter schools, including the employees of education man management companies that were operating those charter schools, were in fact public employees and thus subject to the Code of Governmental Ethics. The specific issue was uh, Charter Schools USA. Their contract with the charter boards for the schools that they run, basically it's a turnkey. And they retain all authority to hire all employees. And those employees' paychecks say Charter Schools USA. And there was a, a, a claim that Charter Schools USA was essentially a vendor of the charter school board. No different than uh, if they hired waste management to come pick up their dumpster, or if they hired ABC Electric to come uh, repair some electrical facility at the school, that they were merely a vendor. And what the Board of Ethics said is that the core governmental function of a public charter school is the operation of a school and that the employees who are engaged in the operation of the school, regardless of whether they draw a paycheck from a public body or a private entity, were in fact themselves subject to the Code of Governmental Ethics as public servants. It actually became, it, it kind, of, kind of rose to attention when it was discovered that um, Charter Schools USA Council was recommending to their staff of those various schools 
that they were not obligated to do the one hour of ethics training because they weren't public servants. Um, and of course, there's a whole lot more owner stuff in the code of ethics, but it was, uh, it was pretty, it was, it was, it was in line. The decision with regard to the charter school operators was in line with the prior decision with those two law firms when it looked at, are they performing a service for the public body or, or are they performing part of the core governmental function of the public body? So next. Now some general prohibitions in the code of governmental ethics. Um, and it applies as applies to elected officials and members of their immediate family. You, you generally can't transact business with, your, with the agency other than with donations of services or movable property. And it's interesting because at one point, even a donation was seen as an other transaction that was prohibited. The legislature actually went in and created the exception of being able to donate to your entity. Um, you also cannot solicit or accept gifts from a prohibited source. Prohibited source being anyone who has or is seeking to have a financial contractual relationship with your agency, which in your case would be the entire OPSB. Um, now, it raises a very interesting question now that the charter schools have been relegated to type three Bs as to a person having a, since you are now the authorizer, I think, again, it would be arguable that a vendor to one of the individual charter schools would likely be a prohibited source to the OPSB because those charter schools now fall within the authority of the OPSB. It, it does, again, y'all get, get to pave the way for some people. I'm <laughs> sure that's fine. Um, one of the things is always ask. Um, another of the general prohibitions is an elected official should not participate in a vote on a matter in which the official, their business, or an immediate family member has a substantial economic interest. Normally, that is an, that is an interest that is in excess of the interest enjoyed by the general public. So, for example, if there is a, if you're voting on a new teacher salary schedule and you've got family members who are teachers, well, you're voting on a salary schedule that would apply, or family members who work in the central office, and you're work, voting on a new salary schedule that'll apply to everybody. You're probably, that's probably not a prohibition because it's a, it's a group. Whereas if you're voting on something that has to do with, the individuals, something that would impact some your immediate family member or a business in which you're an owner more directly, that's when you should probably abstain. Under that provision, if you don't participate in the discussion, you can merely abstain by remaining silent. However, if you choose to participate in the discussion, which you used to not be able to, but you can now, you can actually participate in a discussion. You just may have to abstain from the vote, but if you participate in the discussion, you are obligated to notify the body to say out loud why you're abstaining. So just keep that in mind if it, if it comes up. Now, there are some general exceptions, food and drink consumed in the presence of the giver. I think I got an email uh, yesterday that uh, the the new food and drink limit went up to think this sixty three dollars because it started at fifty and every year it creeps up by inflation and the board of ethics issues it. Um, the big issue about there is it's in the presence of the giver, so someone could actually buy you a sixty dollar meal if they went with you and had the meal with you, but they could not give you a two dollar candy bar. It seems crazy, but again, that's that's the rule. So abide with it. And it gets very difficult come holiday time. How many people get that martyr, that, that king cake and it just shows up and the giver didn't bring it over. Now, if a giver wants to bring a king cake to the school board meeting and y'all sit around and eat king cake and he's there too, that's fine. But if they just have it delivered, then you've got a bit of a problem because it's not consumed in the presence of the giver. And also, it doesn't really matter the value of this food or drink. And like I said, they couldn't, they couldn't buy you a po' boy and drop it off at your office for you to eat and then leave, but they could take you to Ruth's Chris and you could have a, a meal that fell within the, the limit. 
So just be careful about that. Promotional items don't count as gifts. Now, in order for something to be a promotional item, it has to have a company logo on it and it has to have little or no resale value. Um, for any of you that have uh, seen me make the formal ethics presentation on this, uh, there was a gentleman who used to work for the Board of Ethics as an attorney. He now is with the Attorney General's office. He got him named Mike Dupree. And Mike gave me the best way to understand this. If when you receive the gift, you're really excited that they gave you something, that what they gave you, you probably have to give it back. But if it's likely to end up on the floorboard of your car, you, you probably can keep it. So, you know, um, I, I went, when I got the posters made, I got downtown duplicating, gave me some downtown duplicating pens. So if a company gives you pen, you know, okay. Now, if it's a Mont Blanc, probably not, even if it has their logo on it. And they've, they've had some very interesting cases. Uh, they've had situations where a company tried to give away a Browning over and under shotgun with the company logo engraved in the stock. They said not so much. Uh, they've had a leather bomber jacket with the company's logo embroidered on it. No, you can't really do that. Um, I tell people that the, the most difficult one for the Board of Ethics to decide was uh, there was a dispute over a company tried to give a, an elected official a pickup truck with the company logo on the door. And the elected official said, wait, 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 wait. There's the logo. Okay, let's check that box off. And it's a Dodge. It has little or no resale value. No, that doesn't quite work. I'm just kidding. It's, it's just, no. But that's the thing is, is keep it in mind. And, and the easy rule is if what they gave you seems really, really, really cool, you probably need to think about giving it back. But, you know, visors and koozies and pens and, 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 and that sort of stuff is perfectly fine. You just have to avoid the stuff. You know, the, the little plastic leather folio, fine. The, 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 or the old plastic folio, fine. The leather folio made of calf skin that probably cost that guy $200, even if it has the company logo on the corner of it, be just be very careful about it. Um, now, the other big issue that comes up is nepotism. The general nepotism rule is that no member of the immediate family of any agency head shall be employed by his agency. And no, mem no member of the immediate family member of a uh, member of a governing authority or the chief executive of a governing uh, entity shall be employed by the governmental entity. So essentially, your agency, no one, no immediate family member of yours. Now, I didn't include this slide, but those of you that have done your ethics training know that immediate family members are whom? Those are, you know, spouses, siblings, parents. The, and then, then you get into some odd stuff, okay? Who knows when it is legal for you to enter into a brother-in-law deal in Louisiana? Does anybody know when it's okay to issue, to get into a brother-in-law deal? Okay. I have two gentlemen that I refer to as my brother-in-law. Jack is married to my sister, Nancy. Alex is married to my wife's sister. Alex is not my immediate family member. Jack is because the, the spouse of my sibling is an immediate family member, but the sibling of my, the, the spouse of my, my spouse's sibling is not. They're both my brother-in-law, I think, but one is okay and one is not. Um, if you have ever, you ever have any questions, just ask. Now, school boards do have a very significant exception to the nepotism rule. Any local school board may employ any member of the immediate family of any school board or of the superintendent as a classroom teacher, provided that such family member is certified to teach or is temporarily authorized to teach while pursuing certification. Now that's important. Classroom teacher and either certified to teach or is temporarily authorized to teach 
while pursuing certification. So, Mr. Koppel's daughter could be employed as a classroom teacher in an OPSB school, as long as she was certified to teach. If she was not a certified teacher, she could not be a part-time substitute teacher because the exception doesn't extend to her. She could not be a administrative clerk in the OPSB central office because the exception is limited to classroom teacher. Any member of, and, and now once they fall within that exception, they can then get promoted, but you do have to abstain from voting on their matters. Also, next slide, within 30 days of each, of the beginning of each school year, each school board member or superintendent whose immediate family member is employed by the school board shall file a disclosure statement with the Board of Ethics. Now there's another exception that is a general exception to the nepotism rule, and that is when, when the nepotism prohibition took effect, the immediate family member had already been employed for more than a year. So in other words, if, uh, if Ms. Jackson's brother had worked for the school, for the OPSB for 13 months before she took office, that, accept, that nepotism prohibition doesn't apply. However, she will need to list in her report that she has a brother that works for OPSB and file that report each year. And, and usually the school board secretaries are really good about making sure that you get your report filed on time um, and as a reminder to do that. Because understand if you fail to file that report, you're subject to a $50 a day late fee up to $1,500. So just be aware of that and make sure you, you take care of those. And also um, just be aware of that general issue. Again, the issue gets a little bit more interesting at a charter school for which now you've got a school, now you, OPSB is now its authorizer. And frankly, I, I think it would be beneficial to reach out to the Board of Ethics to get some clarity on how that rule is going to be interpreted by them. One of the really good things about the Board of Ethics, and, and I've been doing this a while, and under a prior ethics administrator, he seemed to relish catching people. He kind of thought, he, honestly, he thought his job was to catch people. The current administration seems to have focused more of their attention on trying to help people stay out of trouble. Um, I have always had a very good relationship with those people. And have always find them very willing to respond to an ethics opinion request. If you are not sure if a circumstance that you're currently involved in or that you're anticipating arising is or is not a violation of the Code of Governmental Ethics, you can make that request to the board. Uh, several things will, first of all, you can always call the staff and they'll give you an informal answer. But if, if it's a close call, they're gonna want you to get it formally. You submit your request, Staff will get any other information they need. Staff will tell you what their recommendation to the board is going to be. And then the board will actually have a meeting and vote. Now, I can tell you, I had a circumstance where the staff's recommendation to the board was going to be, no, Dan, your client, the, the, opinion, the advisor opinion is like, I just disagree with y'all. So I waited to the board meeting and I went to the board meeting on behalf of my client. And I made the argument about why I thought my client's activity fell within a particular exception. The board debated it. The board actually agreed with me and voted to direct their staff to issue an opinion that in fact, this person could do what they were planning on doing and it was not a violation of the Code of Governmental Ethics. If there is a serious question, I always advocate doing that, going through that process. Because it's, it just seems to me, if I can get the answer up front when there's no penalties attaching to anyone, that's better than someone taking a risk and then falling in a trap for the unwary and not realizing that what they did was a violation of the Code of Governmental Ethics. Our ethics code 
is, is an apparent conflicts of interest code. It's not about your personal ethics. Because I can tell you, if, if you want to be unethical in public service, there's lots of ways. There's lots of loopholes you can, you can push through. Um, and oftentimes, people who fall into ethics quandaries, it's because they didn't realize it. For example, you know, they, didn't, they did not realize that their, they didn't realize that their, uh, their sister's husband, they didn't know what he did for a living. They didn't realize he, he was the, the guy at the company that was selling stuff to the school system. He didn't, or they didn't realize that the school system was purchasing gas from that person. I mean, there was all these little potential, these pitfalls. And so if you come to a serious question, asking is way better than not. Like I said earlier, the only dumb question is the one you refuse to ask. Because the worst you can do is find out the answer you didn't want to hear, but then what you do is you avoid a bigger problem. Um, now, uh, I will tell you, I see we're getting close to our time. This presentation is a very sort of light look at the Code of Governmental Ethics. It's not the full-blown details into all the little nooks and crannies. It does not satisfy your one-hour ethics requirement, um, but I can tell you um, generally I do that uh, the full hour where you get credit at the LSBA convention, also at other LSBA events, and you can also individually just go online. You can go on to uh, www.ethics.la.gov and you can go into the training. You can click on it. You, you, you put in some information. You, you watch their little slideshow. And it's interesting. It stops every once in a while and asks you questions. I'm going to give you a little hint. Doesn't matter if you get the questions right. It's not a test. It's just to make sure you're still standing in front of your computer. <laughs> it's to make sure that you didn't just turn it on and make and then go watch TV. So it stops every once in a while and makes you answer questions in order to get to the next slide. So there's a little bit of behind the scenes. Um, but you can get much of this information. Now I can tell you, you're not going to learn enough in an ethics presentation to answer all your questions. You're going to learn enough in an ethics presentation to know that you need to ask a bunch of questions, which is why generally when I do the live presentations, I, I get through that PowerPoint as quickly as I can and try to spend as much time letting people ask questions. Now, all questions are, they're hypothetical. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was the lawyer at the Board of Ethics for a while, and um, I've worked for a, a number of public aid entities, and, and when she would come make presentations and people would come up and they would start telling her about something, she'd go, wait, 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 this is all hypothetical, right? And they would say, yes, it is. It's all hypothetical. And so, uh, you know, because she didn't want them to get in trouble by saying something, but uh, I do find that the staff over there is is very willing to help. And if you have a serious question, and frankly, the more and more I thought about it while I was doing this presentation, the three Bs create a very interesting circumstance. And um, and frankly, I, I think those charter boards would want to know, um, or, you know, because they may not have affiliations with each other. And so you may have a vendor who, you know, Two years ago, four, four years ago, they couldn't provide services to that school because a member of that school's charter board, there was a prohibited source. Well, how does it work? It, does, it, does it depend on whether the contract is directly with the charter board and the vendor? Is it a contract where it's a parish-wide service being provided under a contract with the OPSB? Does it change anything now that the OPSB is now the authorizer? for that former type five charter school who's, who, who used to answer to the RSD. I don't know. That's why, uh, that's why we practice law and we don't get it. We don't ever get it right and, and perfect. We just keep practicing it. But I tell my siblings who are far more successful than I that y'all practice medicine too. So I don't want to hear it. And by the way, I had three stripes on my gown before y'all did. Um, even though I don't go by doctor. So, um, all right, we've got about 10 minutes left in this presentation. I, I know I have prattled along. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions if anybody has any.
I don't see any additional questions. Okay. All right. Um, like I said, if there's, and, if there, and again, you know, we, we sort of hit this kind of at a high level on these things. Um, I hope I've, I've encouraged you on a few things. One, recognize that it, you're a member of a board. The authority lies with the board. And at all costs, avoid the notion of, of, of getting so personally invested that it's hard for you to continue to work as a board. Um, and as you move forward, think about your open meetings rules. If it's a close call, think about open meetings and public records. And, and, and if it's a close call, understand it's probably going to go the other way. Um, and, and, and just kind of get in those good habits as opposed to the bad habits. And you will find, particularly with the conduct of your meetings, if y'all present yourselves with decorum and with professionalism, you will train the public to do the exact same thing. And you will find that the public talks more about what you decided and not the ridiculousness of how, it, how the meeting took place. Don't become a member of an unintended circus if you don't have to be. It's just too hard to do this job and you're making too, too important decisions to get bogged down in that other stuff. So if the LSBA can ever be any help, you know, Dr. Pope's door is always open. We are always available by email and um, we will always try to answer to the best of our ability. And without last, last thing I'll say, listen to your lawyer. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dan. There's nothing else. Certainly. Um, y'all have Dan. a, I don't know if y'all have any more left for today, but um, I hope y'all learned a little bit and at least are, are now have the right questions to ask. Y'all have a good day. Thank you, Thank Dan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Bye-bye. Have a good day yourself. Be safe. Thank you, Dan. Y'all too. Goodbye. Uh, at this time, I'd like to actually turn it over to uh, Mary. <laughs> One thing, I don't remember if he said it, but will we get a copy of this presentation? Is that I can circulate it. To, I can circulate it to, the, to you, all of you. Great, thank you. Great, all right. Uh, thank you, President Ashley. Yes, I just wanted to take advantage of this public opportunity to flag for everyone the administration's intent to launch a conversation with the board at the public and the public next week in committee on our work related to considering modified school governance models and different variations of school governance that offer varied levels of direct support to schools. So in some districts, this is referred to as an innovation zone. Um, other districts have called it other things, but, but you may know, but for some time now, our administration has been researching and considering different possible sets of governance models moving forward to increase school performance and stability in our portfolio of schools. So we maintain our commitment to being a primarily charter district, but we are researching the option of some schools operating in a semi-autonomous zone with increased direct support from the district. So just wanted to take advantage of this public opportunity to share that we'll be launching this conversation formally with you all in the public next week. Um, we expect it to take a good 18 months to, to launch this and just wanted to let you know that we look forward to discussing this with you all next week and for the months to come. So thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any other items on the agenda? Uh, if, hearing none, I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved and by Ellison. I have second. a motion by Miss Ellison, a second by by Mr. Brown. Uh, do we have any public comments? Hearing no. none, I'll yield to the board. Council for a roll call vote. Mr. Ashley. Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Ellison? Yes. Ms. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Koppel? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Uh, yes. Ms. Newell Houston? Yes. Motion passes. Great. The time now is 11.53 a.m. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Thank y'all. Be safe. Thank you. Bye.